Hello, everyone. Audiobook Collection here. The upcoming audiobook is a special dedication to one of our incredible Patreon supporters. If you're interested in making your own personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. You can find the link to my Patreon account in the video description below. Your support means the world, and I'm thankful for you joining me on this thrilling audiobook journey. Also if you want audiobook of 300 plus novel you can visit my Kofi shop where you can buy a Google Drive link for just $35. Chapter 76, It's Not Him, It's Me, What? Asked Ron with annoyance only to freeze when he saw Harry's face. Ron, please stop talking, said Harry with a depressed voice. W what happened? What did I say? Was I right? Did he make you handle it all by yourself because he fainted? I knew it, he said adamantly. Ron, the person who was useless wasn't him, it was me, he said as his voice got lower. He saved me, he said. Ron was shocked when he heard that and finally realized what he said. He then spent the next 10 minutes saying sorry to Harry while never even apologizing for what he said to me. Hermione was giggling happily at Ron's misfortune and seemed to forget about lecturing me. Anyway, back to the matter at hand, they have the right to know, after all, it concerned the lives of everyone at school, I said catching everyone's attention. Harry nodded seriously at my words. Harry explained his conversation with Quirrell, the mirror, and his final goal. I just sat there listening. Hermione squealed when she heard that there was a face stuffed underneath Quirrell's turban. And even more so when she found out it was Voldemort's. So, the stone is gone. Ron asked. I don't know actually. All I know is that according to Dumbledore, Voldemort doesn't have it. That is all that matters. He said sighing slightly. Hermione looked at me from the corner of her eye which stunned me for a moment. There is no way that she would know that I took it would she? But I was destined to be wrong. She leaned her face in until she was right next to my ear. You better explain this to me when we are alone mister, she said with a stern gaze. How did you know? I asked. She blushed slightly. I I felt it when I went in to hug you, she explained. I couldn't help but stare at her with my mouth hanging open. It turned out it wasn't due to some kind of genius Sherlock Holmes level detective skills, it was simply by accident. Sometimes I curse my bad luck. So, is he still alive then, you know who, that is. Ron asked still remaining objective and oblivious to our little conversation. Yes, Dumbledore explained that he will probably try to live on the same way he did with Quirrell, by becoming a parasite within another's body, I said simply. Naturally, that wasn't right either. He would later make a body using a concoction Voldemort came up with himself. By mixing Nagini's venom with unicorn blood he was able to give himself that I took over a fetus look. There was silence before Harry asked what happened on Hermione's end. As soon as I got out of the third floor, I ran towards the Olary to contact Dumbledore only to encounter him at the entrance hall he already knew he just said, Harry's gone after him, hasn't he, and disappeared off towards the third floor. Do you think that maybe, he meant for you to go there Harry, asked Ron in a rare instance of great observation. I was surprised that the question came from him and not Hermione. After all, we got there with your father's cloak. The cloak he gave you, he continued. Well, Hermione stood up and looked slightly angry, if he did, and I mean if, then that would be terrible, either one of you could have been killed, she said half shouting. No, I don't think it's to that degree Hermione, said Harry with a thoughtful expression. Dumbledore, he is a funny man. I think this might have been his little test for me. Maybe he wanted to give me, us, a chance. I think he knew about Quirrell from the beginning and had everything under control, and instead of stopping us, he taught us just enough to help. I don't think it was an accident he let me find out about how the mirror works. It's almost like he thought I had the right to face Voldemort if I could. Well, in that case, it proved you didn't have what it takes. If me and Tom hadn't come with you, you wouldn't have even gotten past the first trap, let alone all the others, said Hermione. Harry was downcast after hearing her words. I agreed completely, it wasn't a problem since Quirrell would never get the stone to begin with, but it did serve to illustrate their lack of competence. Anyway, enough of this, listen, you've got to be up for the end of year feast tomorrow. The points are all in and Ravenclaw won, said Ron, his face sour and grim. You missed the last quid ditch game, we were no match without our seeker, he lamented. Just then, Madame Pomfrey burst through the doors. I thought you would leave after the stipulated time, and here I thought you were decent students, especially you Hermione, she said angrily. Out? Now, she yelled ushering both Ron and Hermione out the door. The next day I was awoken to the sound of footsteps. I tried to open my eyes only to be blinded by the rays of sunlight shining through the windows. Professor Dumbledore says that you two are allowed to leave, said an aged female voice. I covered my eyes and adjusted to the sunlight and saw Madame Pomfrey from between the gaps in my fingers. I nodded stiffly and sat up on the bed before searching for my clothes. I found them cleanly piled on top of the nightstand where the thick book Hermione used to read was. It seemed that Hermione had visited me a couple of times during the three days I was out. The funny thing was the stone was still there in the pocket of my cloak. As if no one cared about it. Seems Dumbledore asked Madame Pomfrey to be oblivious to it. Or maybe the nurse just didn't know what it was. Madame Pomfrey didn't stay much longer and left to do her work. Me and Harry soon got dressed and walked out of the infirmary. We soon split ways though since I still had to go visit Professor Dumbledore's office. I didn't exactly know where it was. So, I had to search for Professor McGonagall and ask her where the office was located. She seemed surprised to see me in her office and welcomed me in warmly. 
It is a pleasure to see you healthy and well Mr. Knight. I can only thank you for your service, she said seriously. I was surprised by her change in attitude towards me, but I took it as an opportunity for a clean slate. We talked about what happened briefly before mentioning Dumbledore's office. Ah oh yes, it is located on the seventh floor. Well, due to the ever-changing floor plan, it sometimes appears on the second floor. A tricky thing if you ask me, she said with a soft chuckle. It was the first time I think I have ever seen the professor laugh even in the books and movies. I think I just made history today. I walked out of her classroom a little while later and headed towards the office entrance which according to McGonagall was currently located on the seventh floor. Chapter 77, Fire Chicken and Fire Lizard. I took my time making it towards Dumbledore's office since I need to arrange my thoughts properly. Dumbledore was a sneaky old man that was not afraid of extorting me. Therefore, I couldn't back down at all and needed to be confident or at least act confident at all times. I'll bluff if I have to. I approached the tower that connected to the seventh floor and before long stood in front of a stone gargoyle. It wasn't a stretch to say that the gargoyle guarded the entrance. I was in no mood to test out the efficiency of removing intruders. Professor McGonagall had already informed me of the password which I wouldn't have needed anyway. The movies and books gave me the answer. I approached it slowly and looked at its face calmly before talking, Sherbet Lemon, I said slowly. The gargoyle looked down at me slowly before returning to its normal look and began to slide back before twisting and rising. A spiral stone staircase appeared as if following after the gargoyle. It was a cool contraption. It made me want to know the spell even more now. I walked up the stone steps slowly, there wasn't much to look at anyway. It was empty and there were only some torches on the wall that illuminated the otherwise dark, elevator shaft. What would you call this little place? There was some moss growing in between the large stone slabs embedded into the wall which gave the corridor if that was the right word a humid feel which made it quite nice. It didn't take long before I arrived at a wooden door with metal strips running vertically along with the wooden panels. The door seemed just as old as the others and before I even knocked it slid open as if it had a sentience of its own. Honestly, I wouldn't be so surprised if it did. Barely anything seemed to surprise me much these days. I was desensitized due to all the weird shit here. As I walked into the headmaster's office, I couldn't help but marvel at it. It was a large and beautiful circular room, full of funny little noises. A number of curious silver instruments stood on spindle-legged tables, whirring and emitting little puffs of smoke. The walls were covered with portraits of old headmasters and headmistresses, all of whom were snoozing gently in their frames. The portrait of the immediate predecessor of the current headmaster or headmistress hung behind the head's desk. It was suggested that this was the largest of the paintings in the room, which, in turn, suggested that the paintings shrank by some degree once it was no longer the portrait of the immediate predecessor of the current headmaster or headmistress. It should be noted that despite Severus Snape being headmaster and having access to the office, he did not have a portrait. Eventually, one was installed in tribute to his brave deeds after Voldemort's ultimate defeat. There was also an enormous, claw-footed desk, and, sitting on a shelf behind it, a shabby, tainted wizard's hat. I had to say, it looked nice and inviting. Things were placed in a sort of neat untidiness. It also needed to be mentioned that compared to other teachers' rooms, the headmaster's was by far the most interesting. I walked over towards the hat which seemed to have noticed me as well. Oh, well, if it isn't you boy, what? You're not here to eat my soul are you? He said half jokingly half seriously. I smile slightly. No, you're safe from that tragic fate. I am happy enough in the house I was put in. I said before walking away. There wasn't anything I needed to talk to the hat about. It wasn't like I could learn other secrets anyway. I soon walked up a couple of steps leading straight to Dumbledore's desk and saw Fox perched on a wooden stand. It was a majestic red and orange phoenix. But what stunned me was that Fox flew up and landed on my shoulder. What do we have here? Who knew that a Pendragon arrived at the school after so long, said a rough male voice in my head. I was shocked and snapped my head towards the bird on my shoulder. H how are you able to do that? And what do you mean by what you said? Have you been around for that long in the school? I bombarded the bird with questions. Well, I can do this because I am a phoenix, not all of my abilities are known to others. I seldom show this power. Even Dumbledore doesn't know it paused. Then why me? I asked. Because you are a Pendragon, and because that detestable dragon is inside of you it said with a loathing tone. Who the hell are you calling detestable you fire chicken? Drax spat with annoyance. F fire chicken? Why you dare to call me that? Said Fox with so much anger I could even feel it. I sighed. It was getting crowded in my head. Listen, both of you, stop arguing. Drac cut it out. Fox continue please. I said putting an end to their squabbling. TCH fine, this isn't over chicken said Drac reluctantly. Whatever, anyway as I was saying, it is not a matter of being here constantly. I am connected to the Dumbledore family for generations. That does not mean I don't have my free time. I just so happened to be here when another family member of yours arrived here. He was much less talented than you are though, but he still did his thing. Fox concluded with a nonchalant attitude. I see, well that explains it I said while shrugging my shoulders. Before I could continue with my conversation though, an aged voice was heard off to the side. Chapter 78, who outplays who? Beautiful, isn't he? Although I'm surprised that he decided to be so intimate. He hasn't done that with anyone ever, Dumbledore said with a smile. I guess it goes on to further prove just how extraordinary you are, he said before sitting down at his desk. 
Fox flapped his wings and flew back to its perch before getting comfortable. His name is Fox by the way, he said as if remembering something. Yes, he is a magnificent bird. I paused and looked at Fox deeply with a smile. I then turned my head towards the massive bookcase. Impressive collection of books you have here, I said as I looked at them greedily. There should be some juicy stuff tucked away and hidden in here. Oh, if you like it that much, you should come here and read whenever you have time, he said with a cunning smile. I was about to accept when Fox stopped me. Don't, if you want to make a deal with him, you can't receive anything for free, he will easily use this for the stone he said quickly. I was surprised but did my best to hide it. Who knew Dumbledore was already laying it on thick? If it wasn't for Fox I would be screwed. Drac why aren't you this helpful? I complained jokingly. Hmph, it was because I couldn't open my mouth fast enough. The fire chicken beat me to it he tried to justify himself. I knew he didn't even think about it. Thank you, Fox. I said warmly before looking at Dumbledore calmly. No thank you, Professor, it is not necessary, I said with an innocent smile. Dumbledore was good at hiding his disappointment, but the small twitch of his lips gave it away. Oh, where are my manners, please take a seat, will you, he said stretching his hand out which pointed at the chair opposite him. It was extremely comfortable to sit on. It reminded me of the spell they use on broomsticks so that it is actually as comfortable as sitting on a couch. Very useful. Would you like some tea, he asked. If you'd be so kind, I responded. Tea was a great way to relax and have a long and productive chat. He didn't take long to serve the tea and handed it to me with a little ceramic plate as well. It was hot and sweet as it warmed up my mouth. Let's get straight to the point, shall we? I said while putting my cup back on my side of his desk. We can, he said calmly. I nodded and took out the stone and laid it on the desk. The red luster burst out radiantly. It's really an interesting and curious object, isn't it? He said calmly while taking a sip of his tea, having no intention of taking it. I guess you could say so. I mean, it seems to be able to do more than it leads people to believe, I said slowly. Oh, do tell Mr. Knight, he said curiously. I don't think this should come as a surprise to you, but it seems that stone has a way of giving people a body. Otherwise, why would Voldemort search for it so fervently? I spoke. Why do you think this doesn't come as a surprise to me? He asked with the same curious expression. I sighed, it seems he was playing dumb. Aurelius I said simply. But the reaction I got was beyond anything I could have imagined. He burst into laughter, so loud and abrupt that it shocked me. Even Fox looked at him in confusion. Mr. Knight, I must say, the things you know, seem to not correlate with your age or background. May I know as to where you got this information from? He asked with an amused expression. I decided to continue. Just a conjecture of mine. Knowing your history, and character to an extent, I can deduce that this is something you would do. What exactly did I do and why? He asked. You kept your sister's obscurus and tried to use the stone on it. I'm baffled as to why you would think Ariana would come back but I can't blame you for trying. As for what became of the result, well, you and me both know how that ended. I said simply, what a marvelous hypothesis. I don't understand why or how you know of this. And I won't ask you to reveal it either. I cannot and will not attempt to read your mind again. Not only because I can't, but as a show of faith and goodwill. After all, if I wanted to know so badly, there is little you can do against Veritaserum. He said with a smile before looking at my tea. It seemed he had it all thought out. I stared at my tea with a small trace of fear. I had actually been so naive. If he really did go through with it, would I have spilled all my secrets? I asked myself. No, I would have stopped your body from doing so. And I'm sure Fox would have done something as well. There are certain things some people shouldn't know. Plus, when you reach a high enough level in acclumency, you can resist the potion's effects he concluded. I was slightly relieved at his words, but I realized I was still too green. Yes well, that might have very well been a game changer, Professor. I nodded in acknowledgement. Well, then doesn't that prove my goodwill, he asked with a smile. I nodded again. It seems so. As for your hypothesis, well, let's just say that I was at my lowest and decided to give it one last try. It seemed I had made things worse instead. Well, I guess it depends on who you ask really. As for Voldemort, he must have found out about it some way or another. That is the downside of being in the light. It is hard to get rid of loose ends, he said with a chuckle. I was shocked at his answer. Who knew he would be this open and regretful about not killing a bunch of loose ends? Though, the way I see it, he is able to say all of this since it's in both of our best interests for this conversation to remain in this room. There was a silence that permeated the study for a moment. We only drank our tea quietly before I decided to continue. Chapter 79, Extortion. Why? I suddenly said without context. Why? He asked back. Why didn't you take the stone when you had the chance? I had fainted, and even now, the stone is right there but you refuse to take it. I said with slight puzzlement. That was the part I didn't understand. Sure, I could have taken the stone off you on many occasions. But it isn't a stretch to say that I wanted to see what you would do. I must say, you never cease to surprise me. The things you know, how you act, and the things you have accomplished all in one year are fascinating. That is why. Nothing more nothing less. He said calmly. But I am surprised that you're giving it to me so easily. Don't you want it? After all, you must have taken it for a reason, right? He said curiously. I smiled slightly when he mentioned that. You're correct, I did take it for a reason, but I do not want the stone. It is of no use to me apart from making me rich. 
which I have no issue doing by myself. I said calmly. Dumbledore perked up when he heard that and sat up a little straighter. Oh, continue, what is it you wanted with the stone? He asked. A negotiation of sorts, I wish for something, and in return, you can save your friend's life. Simple stuff, right? I said with a grin. Dumbledore's eyebrows furrowed slightly as he looked at me. And what is it you want? He asked. Knowledge, I wish for knowledge professor. Should be something you can provide, right? I asked. He looked at me and then at the books on his shelf before nodding slowly. I do not wish for only access to these books, no no, I want full access to the forbidden section for me and Hermione, I said adamantly. This isn't much of a negotiation if there's no bargaining, he said with a stiff smile. Oh, sorry, did I say negotiation? I meant extortion. Dumbledore's lips twitched slightly as he looked at me. He sat there quietly for a moment before shaking his head. No, that won't do. There are things in the forbidden section children your age shouldn't have access to. But, I can make an exception if it's only you, Granger can't come. You must also forfeit your right to come here and read my books, he said after a bit of thought. I knew that this was fine if it was just me since that was my goal. But thinking about Hermione and her incessant nagging, I simply didn't want to deal with it. Plus, in a sense she was helpful. Two people can cover more ground than one. Professor, I wonder how much pressure I would have to exert in order to break this stone. I said while looking at it as it lay on the desk. Dumbledore looked puzzled but still smiled slightly. I do not think it will be possible, he said confidently. He would be right if it was anyone else. I was sure it would be incredibly tough to break, but I had Drac. Why don't we try it then? I said before stretching my hand out and grabbing it. Dumbledore looked on intently with intrigue. I simply looked at it before clenching my fist burying it inside. I clenched tighter and tighter and began to use Drac's power and concentrated it all on my forearm and fingers. Soon, a small cracking noise could be heard, and Dumbledore slightly flinched. That is enough. I didn't think you could manage it. It seems I was mistaken. Let me see, I can give you and Granger a pass for two years into the Forbidden section. That means next year and the year after. But you will still have to forfeit reading my books, he said while rubbing his forehead. I smiled happily and accepted. Next year I would be able to extort him for more. I think I got a winning bargain. He didn't get anything, and I got half a library full of incredibly useful knowledge. Very well, I will tell Madame Pants to expect you and Granger there next year, he said reluctantly. Pleasure doing business with you. Businesses when both parties benefit, he said helplessly. Oh, whatever could you mean professor, did I not perhaps, save Potter from certain death due to your miscalculation? Did I not perhaps save everyone from Voldemort's return after he got the stone from Potter's dead corpse? I think you earned a lot here. If anything, I came out with a losing bargain, I said with fake disappointment. Maybe we should discuss our arrangement again, I asked. No no, that won't be necessary, it is all fair, all fair, he said with a stiff smile. I ran out of tea, and he soon filled it up for me again. Now, moving on to the second topic, I would like to ask you, Tom, what do you think of Harry, he said as he poured the tea. I was surprised at his question but answered truthfully. Ignorant, naive, low self-esteem, incredibly dependent and has little to no motivation towards school. I evaluated. Dumbledore was surprised that I had just spat that out as if I was ready for the question all along. What can I say, I'm stuck in his class all year. You evaluate everyone, I said with a helpless shrug. Cough you seem to know him well. I plan to let the Gryffindor house win. He paused. To boost Harry's confidence, I assume. I asked. Correct, but because of our little chat before you fainted, I cannot give you any points. I plan to award Longbottom, Grander, Weasley and Harry for their efforts. You're not regretting it, are you? If you are, you can simply take the fame and I will take back the passes, he said excitedly as if he was about to go do that this moment. No no, that is not the case, I said as my lips twitched uncontrollably. This was not what I expected from Dumbledore. He didn't try to hide his disappointment but cheered up anyway. Professor, can you tell me why you manipulated the snitch in Harry's first game? I asked suddenly with a grin. His face froze as he looked at me in surprise. I did not think anyone caught that. Well, I can't expect much less from you, he said trying to move away from the conversation. Well, I would be happy to hammer down in Harry's ineptitude and lecture him about why he's not adequate, which would ruin the little scheme you're concocting if you don't add something to the table. You know, it's only fair that way. Sai what do you want, he said with a tired expression. Not much, just access to your books, I said pointing at the massive collection on the bookcases. Dumbledore looked at me with a helpless expression before nodding. I smiled happily and got up but stopped suddenly. I swear I saw Dumbledore flinch. Yes, Tom? Anything else? He asked cautiously. I was just wondering, why go through all this trouble when you could directly strong arm the decision and call the shots at the feast tonight? I could see the relief on his face when I said that. I wondered what I missed during the year to make him have such a reaction. Slightly disappointed at the missed opportunity but what could I do? Well, if I do so, Professor Snape would be very angry and the other students are very hard to handle themselves, and since I am a headmaster, I need to be fair to all students, he said. Even if you use tricks. I smiled. Yes, even if I have to use tricks. He replied. I smiled in understanding. We both shared a brief laugh before I proceeded towards the door. You know Tom, you remind me of someone, said Dumbledore suddenly. 
I stopped in my tracks when I heard him say that. I turned around and looked at him with curiosity. Oh, really? Can I ask who? Ah, a very old friend of mine, he responded, seeming as if the question brought back certain memories. Who do you think it is? I asked. Huh? Well well well, it seems I was right to pick that person after all said Drac. What do you mean? The person I suspect he is talking about is the same person I will take you to meet he said with a chuckle. Can't you just tell me? Don't bother about it, you will know when you need to know he said. I didn't bother to ask further. Whoever it was, I'm eager to meet them if both Drac and Dumbledore see a resemblance of them in me. Odd fellows these old people are Dutch after 80, what a year it has been. I best be on my way then professor, I hope we have such fruitful discussions in the years to follow, I said meaningfully before walking out the door. I didn't wait for his reply and descended the same spiral staircase and passed the gargoyle statue before heading to the common room. Dash. My oh my, that boy is a handful, said Dumbledore as he rubbed his temples. Who would have known he was so perceptive? And to think he was able to extort everything he wanted from me in the end. My, how the mighty have fallen, he mumbled with a self-deprecating smile. I wonder what he meant by having more of such discussions, if it was up to me, I wouldn't want to negotiate with him ever again. He stood up and walked towards the second floor via the stairs and looked out into the lake where a massive squid could be seen splashing around. Ah, I wonder how you're doing, my old friend, he whispered with a complicated gaze. Far into the distance in a remote part of Austria Europe, a massive stone structure could be seen. Naturally, it was hidden from sight due to enchantments. On the entrance, a set of distinctive words were engraved. And on the topmost floor, an old man sat silently, hunched over with his head bowed. But for some odd reason, he sprang to life and jolted his head upwards. He looked into the expanse of clouds that frolicked in the sky happily. My oh my, who could be thinking of me at this time, he asked with a slight smile. His short messy white hair and tattered clothes gave him a homeless vibe. His single, oddly white eye stared into the open sky questioningly before a butterfly flew into the room. He stretched his hand out to support the butterfly, only for it to get zapped by lightning out of nowhere. He smiled before it slowly receded until only his cold, emotionless, stone-like face remained. His eyes that stared out into the endless sky dimmed once again. His figure that had been filled with sudden vitality for a mere second, deflated, and his hunched, desolate frame took shape once more. Dash. I quickly arrived back at the common room and was ignored like always. The only difference was, everyone was huddling around like a bunch of penguins seeking warmth. They all swarmed around Harry asking questions and whatnot. I didn't fail to spot Hermione who sat in our usual spot reading the book that previously took residence on my nightstand. A book on combat spells. It seems that my little adventure sparked some of her dormant fighting spirit. Are you still reading that book? I asked while I sat next to her. Of course, I need to be ABL Tom, she exclaimed only realizing who asked the question halfway through her answer. She turned towards me and hugged me tightly for a moment before breaking away. I'm glad to see you are alright, she said with a happy smile. I must admit, I have grown used to her smile. Except for those buck teeth. I really do wonder if she will grow into them. I thought myself while staring at her. Tom, she asked, rousing me from my odd thoughts. Yes yes, right, I'm alright, I said messily. She didn't seem to bother much about my response. To answer your question, I cannot simply allow you to go off doing such things on your own Tom. Henceforth, I'll be putting much more effort into dueling and offensive spells, she said adamantly. I simply looked at her silently for a little while. I don't really get why but I was happy to have her as a friend. I don't know why I felt so sentimental currently, but I embraced it and gave her a soft hug before getting up. Come Hermione, the others are heading to the Great Hall for the end of year feast, I said extending a hand. Hermione was frozen there for a moment with a light blush on her cheeks. Maybe I overdid it a bit. But it was better than never showing appreciation for the effort and concern others put in. Hermione snapped out of it and stared at my hand before taking it. I propped her up and followed behind the swarm of red and gold sweaters that were worn by our peers. We made our way through the crowded corridors, the great hall was incredibly boisterous and lively. There were students of all grades chatting merrily. It was a very cheerful time as the end of the school year had arrived. Exams were over and the long-awaited holidays would be all there was in sight for a long time. The only thing that slightly dulled the lively mood were the colors that hung from the ceilings. Blue and bronze draped the sides of the walls that gave a royalistic-like feel. The Ravenclaw students were the happiest bunch out of all the students. After all, they had won for the first time in six whole years. When we walked in, there were some stares and muffled chats, but it was all directed at Harry and not to me, much to my pleasure. I'm annoyed that no one knows that you were the one to save the day, said Hermione in annoyance. I put my arm around her shoulder and whispered in her ear. I prefer it that way, I doubt you would want other people annoying us constantly and whispering about who knows what, right? I asked calmly. Hermione nodded slightly but her ears were slightly red. I sighed lightly and distanced myself from her and sat down in an empty chair. The whispers continued and it didn't take long before Hermione leaned in. I'm glad you're so wise, she said with a giggle before turning her head towards Professor Dumbledore who had just walked in. Similar to Hermione, he caught the attention of everyone present which stopped all the chatter in its tracks, much to the visible relief of Harry. Another year is gone, he said cheerfully, and I must trouble you with an old man's wheezing waffle before we sink our teeth into this delicious feast we have prepared. What a year it has been. 
Hopefully, your heads are a little fuller than they were, you have the whole summer ahead to get them nice and empty before next year starts, he said before pausing. Did you hear that Ron? Maybe you'll even forget your name if you empty your head any more than it already is, I said mockingly. Ron was indignant but couldn't respond as Dumbledore continued shortly after my comment. An, holy shit. I'm finally finished with the first year. Thank you to everyone who supported this novel, I appreciate every single one of you. From here on it changes drastically. I'm very excited to show you what I have in store. Hope you enjoyed the chapter and I wish you a good day or night wherever you are. Chapter 81, House Cup Changes. Now, as I understand it, the house cup here needs a warding, and the points stand thus, in fourth place, Gryffindor, with 322 points, he paused again. There was a stiff clapping going on in the hall as the Gryffindor students had sullen looks on their faces. Harry looked downcast and so did Ron. Hermione just glared at them intensely. In third, Hufflepuff, with 352, Slytherin has 421 and Ravenclaw, 473. The same pause and clap happened after he announced every house and there was a resounding applause when Ravenclaw was announced the winner. I really felt bad for the poor fools. It was completely unfair of Dumbledore to do what he was going to do. And what made it worse was, no one could refuse unless it was Harry, Ron, Neville, and Hermione. None of which had the balls to do so since they would be crucified by the rest of the house. I could see Cho and the other Ravenclaw students banging the goblets on the table. Yes yes, well done, Ravenclaw, well done, said Dumbledore. However, recent events must be taken into account. The room went eerily quiet and still. The Ravenclaw students' smiles somewhat faded and their eyes slightly dimmed. It seems that they weren't put in that house for nothing. Most of them probably had an inkling as to what was happening. Well, maybe the older ones. The younger ones were still fairly happy. Ahem, said Dumbledore while in clearing his throat, or was he clearing the tense atmosphere? I have a few last minute points to award. Let me see. Ah yes, let's start here. He paused for a moment. First to Miss Hermione Granger, for her outstanding intellect and use of deductive skills in the face of danger, I award Gryffindor House, 50 points. Hermione froze in place for a moment before mechanically turning her head. I smiled slightly and patted her shoulder. She only took a few moments to get her thoughts together before smiling brilliantly. A somewhat more composed look than she would have had if she was still such a stickler for points. It seems my lessons had paid off. The Gryffindor house clapped loudly and cheered for Hermione joyfully. Such two face pieces of trash. All year they looked down on her for either being a studious person or for offering to help when they were struggling. And look at them now, all happy and smiling idiotically while praising her. That was the only thing that soured this for me. But seeing Hermione so happy, I forced myself to hide it. Second, to Mr. Harry Potter, said Dumbledore. The loudly cheering students instantly became quiet. Deadly quiet. For pure nerve and outstanding courage, I award Gryffindor House 60 points. The cheers were unbearable, it was so loud. All those who could add while yelling until their throats were hoarse knew that Gryffindor now had 432 points. That was second place. I was just snickering with Hermione off to the side as we watched Harry's flustered face. I didn't know a sleeping man could earn so many points whispered Hermione as she leaned in close. I laughed loudly which was drowned out by the cheering. Dumbledore raised his hand suddenly and the room gradually but steadily quietened down. There are all kinds of courage, he smiled, it takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but even more to do so when faced with our friends. I therefore, award 25 points to Mr. Neville Longbottom, and 25 points to Mr. Ronald Weasley for his loyal and dependent personality, even when faced with danger. Dumbledore was bullshitting the end, but it was what it was. Hermione's jaw dropped and burst into a mocking laughter. She was lucky it was drowned out by the massive applause of the other students. Ron went purple in the face. He looked like a radish with a bad sunburn. It was hilarious to look at. That was it. The house cheered incredibly loudly as they realized that they were now first place. It was insane. The Ravenclaw house was in dismay and the Slytherin house, well, they were pouting angrily with their edgy professor over there in the corner. Harry, Ron, and even Neville stood up and started cheering madly with joy. It was only me and Hermione who were seated enjoying the show. Which means, Dumbledore called over the storm of cheering and applause, we need a change in decoration. He clapped his hands. And the originally blue and bronze banners blew backwards as if there was a strong wind and when they fell again, they were gold and red with a lion imprinted in the middle. Snape could be seen in his seat shaking Professor McGonagall's hand with a twisted stiff smile. What was interesting was the McGonagall was actually smiling smugly. Very interesting. The feast started and everyone ate to their heart's content. It was a cheerful atmosphere we all reveled in. It wasn't until the next day that the exam results came out. To my shock and Hermione's, Harry and Ron passed with good marks. I cursed the old man. The extent he went to in order to help Harry surprised even me. I could only shake my head wryly. As for me and Hermione, well, it was a draw. Both our names were on the top spot. I was surprised since I got extra points for transfiguration but when I saw points deducted on potions, I had the urge to kill Snape. Chapter 82, Unexpected Inconvenience. I sat down on the side of my bed and reflected over the year. It had been a great time. I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I did. Classes did get a bit monotonous by the second half of the year but there wasn't much I could do about that. The curse of having a perfect memory. 
I would be moving the training to the Roar next year since there would be a need for targets and other things which the Roar could provide. I will have to show Hermione how to access it. I soon thought about the family vault. The Pendragon vault is supposedly guarded by a Hungarian horn tail. It was meant to be an iron belly but why have that thing when you can have one that's better? I wondered what could be in there. Nothing, it's been emptied over the centuries. Your family at one point was able to effectively hide in the wizarding community but that didn't last long before raids were conducted on their property. Since then, they have gone back into hiding taking all the money with them and have been living off of it ever since. There is, however, some special things that have not been taken that are going to be important. Hearing his words, I was a little disappointed to be honest. But he did say that there was something in there. What is it? What's in there that's so important? I asked septically. If it was left behind it can't be so important. A ring he said simply. A ring? What use will that have? It's not a normal ring you idiot. It has power inside of it. A very special power that can only be ignited a couple of times before it breaks. This will be the last use, but it will hold incredible value. It will allow us to talk to someone very important he said vaguely. I had learned not to bother asking for more since I wouldn't get anything. Okay, so I assume we will need to visit the vault, right? Wrong again, a key is needed. Being a dragon wielder only gives you the qualification to access the vault. A key is still needed he spoke. Where is this key then? I asked in annoyance. All these issues just to get into a bloody vault. It's not in Europe. It's in America. Hidden inside a chamber deep within the American school of witchcraft and wizardry, Ilvermorny. He said helplessly. I grimaced at his words. Why the hell is it all the way over there? I yelled. Such an inconvenience. And it wasn't a small one like the others. It was a massive one. It was pretty much another philosopher's stone. For God's sake, whoever put it there is a dickhead. It has been around, a century or so I'd say. When I was sealed inside of your great-grandfather, he put the key there for safekeeping back when he was close friends with the headmaster there. Sadly, we can't just ask for it since it was a secret to begin with. So, we will have to enroll into Ilvermorny and take the key before the new year at the latest. The good thing is that America follows the same school system that Hogwarts does so we have about three months worth of time to get the key starting from September. As for why three months, it's so that we have enough time to face Voldemort at our own pace upon return. Otherwise, we will be pressured and hurried. And that may lead to mistakes he concluded. I sighed at my fate. It seems that after Hawaii I will be staying in America instead of returning. Damn and now, I became the Professor Quirrell of the story. Damn it. I just hope there isn't some trio over there who want to play detective and mess with my plans. Otherwise, I'll bury them where they stand tch, pesky kids, I'm not even there yet and I can already feel a headache coming on. Maybe I'm jinxing myself by saying that though, or maybe I'm jinxing myself by thinking that I'm jinxing myself. Cut it out. You're such a crybaby, man up you coward and get it done. We need to talk to this person he reprimanded. Fine fine, whatever, this is such a drag though, I groaned. This really did annoy me. There was more work to do now, I thought that I would have it easy next year. Just sit back, watch some people turn to stone and reap the benefits when the time was ripe. But now I was pushed for time. Things could go wrong if I delayed. The wrong people could be petrified or killed if I wasn't careful and slacked off. TCH TCH TCH, so much to do, so little time. And I even have that trial bullshit you're having me do, I complained endlessly. I wish it was more severe, maybe then it would shut you up he hissed. We continued to argue for a while before getting tired of it. I got changed into literally the only clothes that even fit me, barely at that. I really had grown too much. I saw Hermione sitting on the couch with her eyes closed. She was wearing a yellow oversized jumper, blue jeans, and white sneakers. I sat down on the couch next to her and talked before heading to the kitchen. We were planning to head to the lake for a break. Enjoy the sunlight and the view for the first time. I really didn't realize what I had missed. I was so busy doing my exercises, studying and working on this year's plan that I never took the time to enjoy the scenery. We talked about this on the couch and Hermione concluded the same thing and we therefore decided on this idea. And, surprise, Ilvern Morney Wizarding School. Hope you're as excited as I am. I haven't read many if any fanfics that delve into the American school or society. So I decided to jump off the deep end. Lots of things will be going on in America so stay tuned and find out more. Happy reading chapter 83, last few days. We walked towards the kitchen and met the hard-working house elves again. Hermione didn't have that complicated look filled with pity and sadness with a hint of anger. She was used to it and was determined to change the views and laws concerning elves which I liked. It would give her a goal. She didn't come off as an aggressive fighter type but more of calm behind the scenes type. But that did not take away from the fact that she actually knocked me to the ground once during our duels. I was very happy to see that happen. It meant that one, I couldn't slack off, and two that Hermione was getting incredibly comfortable using spells in quick succession. We asked for some burgers and chucked them into a basket that I carried as we made our way over to the lake. It was a nice summer day, it wasn't that hot, and the wind was refreshing. It only got better when we actually reached the body of water though. We set up the blanket and placed the basket in front of us and began to eat as we saw the Weasley twins messing with the giant squid in the lake. I realized something. It wasn't magic that pulled the boats when we arrived and when we would leave, but it was actually the squid. It also puzzled me for a while as to how the squid got here in the first place. 
I thought that maybe this was why Newt Scamander was expelled but then threw the idea away since it wasn't said to be the reason for his expulsion. I then theorized that there was actually a type of passageway that led to different bodies of water, like the ocean or other lakes for example. That would explain how the drumstrang school appeared David Jones style from under the lake. They went through the passageway. So that meant that the squid wasn't always here and why it didn't show itself when the Triwizard tournament occurred. It simply wasn't there to begin with. Very interesting stuff. We spent a good couple of hours chatting happily surrounded by lush green grass, flowers, and butterflies flying around doing their own thing. Tom, what are you going to be doing over the holidays? Asked Hermione as she leaned back on her hands. Well, me and my family will be going to Hawaii for a vacation for about two weeks. Which will be nice. And then I'll stay there since I'll be transferring over to Ilvermorny School of Magic. I said calmly. Hermione could be seen nodding calmly until I mentioned transferring. She turned towards me in a split second and looked me in the eye. What? Why? How? When? She spat out quickly and incoherently. I placed my hands on her shoulders to calm her down slightly. Relax, I'll be back by New Year. I just wanted to see what American school will be like. I lied. What else am I supposed to say? Hey Hermione, don't worry. I'll just be imitating Professor Quirrell and steal something from the school. Sure, she would drown me in the lake if I said that. She seemed to calm down for a moment and looked out into the lake with a pensive look. What if I came with you? I always wanted to know what America was like, she asked. I flinched. I did not need her coming with me. I need to work. Not pretend to be a student in front of others and Hermione. That would simply be too tiring and cumbersome. Would your parents let you? I asked. There was no way of telling her not to come without sounding suspicious. Sigh no, they wouldn't, she said dejectedly. I couldn't help but cheer slightly in my heart. Thank God. One obstacle was avoided successfully. Don't worry, I'll be back before you know it. Anyway, that's my plans, what are yours? I asked trying to divert the conversation. I could see Hermione beam a brilliant smile when I said that. I'll be going to France. There are a lot of things there including their own ministry of magic, stores and history. I look forward to going through it all, she said excitedly. I was glad that she was off my case and smiled. I was happy for her. For someone like Hermione, going to another country and exploring their magical history was like a haven. We soon packed up our things and made our way back to our rooms. The next few days passed quickly since Hermione and me spent time together going around looking at all the things there was to see at Hogwarts. We even got permission from McGonagall and went to Hogsmeade and to the Hog's Head where I caught a glimpse of Aberforth Dumbledore. Naturally, we didn't drink anything and left quickly. At some point, we arrived at the Shrieking Shack and decided to go inside. There was a passage here that the Marauders used to get in and out of the school. Naturally, this was the place where Sirius revealed himself in the third year. We didn't stay long but I gave the place one last meaningful glance before leaving. The day had arrived for us to leave back home. Seamus, Dean, and I were sitting on our beds talking about random things. Seamus had a crush on some girl from Ravenclaw which surprised me slightly. Dean being the studious one didn't notice the opposite gender much and stuck to his book which I found commendable. Naturally, I knew he would lose that when he dated Ginny but that didn't matter. Seamus then transitioned rather oddly to his mother and what he would be doing when he got home. Dean did the same and when they heard about my plans, they were slightly saddened. We had been getting along much better over the course of the second half of the year. They were surprisingly fun people to hang around. And unlike a certain duo, they didn't do stupid shit all the time. Except for Seamus, he blew things up whenever he got the chance. Accidentally or intentionally, it was still to be determined. We packed up our things and when we walked out of the men's wing, I joined up with Hermione which earned me the reproachful looks of Seamus and Dean. But that look soon turned into a mischievous one as they gave me a thumbs up. Made me laugh which was fine, I simply nodded and winked slightly which stunned them into a stupor. They stood there rooted, looking at me as I walked beside Hermione. Chapter 83, Last Few Days. We walked towards the kitchen and met the hard-working house elves again. Hermione didn't have that complicated look filled with pity, and sadness with a hint of anger. She was used to it and was determined to change the views and laws concerning elves which I liked. It would give her a goal. She didn't come off as an aggressive fighter type but more of calm behind the scenes type. But that did not take away from the fact that she actually knocked me to the ground once during our duels. I was very happy to see that happen. It meant that one, I couldn't slack off, and two that Hermione was getting incredibly comfortable using spells in quick succession. We asked for some burgers and chucked them into a basket that I carried as we made our way over to the lake. It was a nice summer day, it wasn't that hot, and the wind was refreshing. It only got better when we actually reached the body of water though. We set up the blanket and placed the basket in front of us and began to eat as we saw the Weasley twins messing with the giant squid in the lake. I realized something. It wasn't magic that pulled the boats when we arrived and when we would leave, but it was actually the squid. It also puzzled me for a while as to how the squid got here in the first place. I thought that maybe this was why Newt Scamander was expelled but then threw the idea away since it wasn't said to be the reason for his expulsion. I then theorized that there was actually a type of passageway that led to different bodies of water, like the ocean or other lakes for example. That would explain how the drumstrang school appeared David Jones style from under the lake. They went through the passageway. So that meant that the squid wasn't always here and why it didn't show itself when the Triwizard tournament occurred. It simply wasn't there to begin with. Very interesting stuff. 
We spent a good couple of hours chatting happily surrounded by lush green grass, flowers, and butterflies flying around doing their own thing. Tom, what are you going to be doing over the holidays? Asked Hermione as she leaned back on her hands. Well, me and my family will be going to Hawaii for a vacation for about two weeks. Which will be nice. And then I'll stay there since I'll be transferring over to Ilvermorny School of Magic. I said calmly. Hermione could be seen nodding calmly until I mentioned transferring. She turned towards me in a split second and looked me in the eye. What? Why? How? When? She spat out quickly and incoherently. I placed my hands on her shoulders to calm her down slightly. Relax, I'll be back by New Year. I just wanted to see what American school will be like. I lied. What else am I supposed to say? Hey Hermione, don't worry, I'll just be imitating Professor Quirrell and steal something from the school. Sure, she would drown me in the lake if I said that. She seemed to calm down for a moment and looked out into the lake with a pensive look. What if I came with you? I always wanted to know what America was like, she asked. I flinched. I did not need her coming with me. I need to work. Not pretend to be a student in front of others and Hermione. That would simply be too tiring and cumbersome. Would your parents let you? I asked. There was no way of telling her not to come without sounding suspicious. Sino, they wouldn't, she said dejectedly. I couldn't help but cheer slightly in my heart. Thank God. One obstacle was avoided successfully. Don't worry, I'll be back before you know it. Anyway, that's my plans, what are yours? I asked trying to divert the conversation. I could see Hermione beam a brilliant smile when I said that. I'll be going to France. There are a lot of things there including their own ministry of magic, stores and history. I look forward to going through it all, she said excitedly. I was glad that she was off my case and smiled. I was happy for her. For someone like Hermione, going to another country and exploring their magical history was like a haven. We soon packed up our things and made our way back to our rooms. The next few days passed quickly since Hermione and me spent time together going around looking at all the things there was to see at Hogwarts. We even got permission from McGonagall and went to Hogsmeade and to the Hogshead where I caught a glimpse of Aberforth Dumbledore. Naturally, we didn't drink anything and left quickly. At some point, we arrived at the Shrieking Shack and decided to go inside. There was a passage here that the Marauders used to get in and out of the school. Naturally, this was the place where Sirius revealed himself in the third year. We didn't stay long but I gave the place one last meaningful glance before leaving. The day had arrived for us to leave back home. Seamus, Dean, and I were sitting on our beds talking about random things. Seamus had a crush on some girl from Ravenclaw which surprised me slightly. Dean being the studious one didn't notice the opposite gender much and stuck to his book which I found commendable. Naturally, I knew he would lose that when he dated Ginny but that didn't matter. Seamus then transitioned rather oddly to his mother and what he would be doing when he got home. Dean did the same and when they heard about my plans, they were slightly saddened. We had been getting along much better over the course of the second half of the year. They were surprisingly fun people to hang around. And unlike a certain duo, they didn't do stupid shit all the time. Except for Seamus, he blew things up whenever he got the chance. Accidentally or intentionally, it was still to be determined. We packed up our things and when we walked out of the men's wing, I joined up with Hermione which earned me the reproachful looks of Seamus and Dean. But that look soon turned into a mischievous one as they gave me a thumbs up. Made me laugh which was fine, I simply nodded and winked slightly which stunned them into a stupor. They stood there rooted, looking at me as I walked beside Hermione. Chapter 84, Back in London. As we walked through the corridors, I was almost reluctant to leave. I would miss this place. And the funny thing was, I didn't know why, but I accepted it and moved on. We went past the courtyard and down the winding steps from which we ascended when we first arrived a year ago. Hagrid was already waiting there for us. We didn't take long to get in the boats. Seamus, Dean Hermione, and I sat in the boat. The lads decided to join since there were two spots left. And I quickly chose them over the dumb duo that was making their way over. The boat soon began to move along, and I couldn't help but lean my head out the side of the boat only to see a crocken-looking beast looming underneath. I would be lying if I said I wasn't slightly scared. It was massive. I always had massive respect for the ocean and its creatures. This one was no exception and I quietly sat on the boat itching to get off. Even if I knew that it wasn't going to do anything and that it would even help me if I fell in, it was still an unreasonable fear I had. It didn't take long for us to reach the other end and I was the first one to touch land. It really was like the saying said. Ignorance is bliss. Thankfully it was a one-year thing since we would be taking the carriages from next year onwards. We soon arrived at the train station at Hogsmeade where the iconic red and black steam train waited quietly for the students to get on. I saw Harry receiving a book which I knew had pictures of his parents. A good thing to have. Me and Hermione parted ways with Seamus and Dean since they went to find their other friends. I followed behind Hermione as she found an empty compartment for the both of us. Once inside we locked the door so that there would be no interruptions and got comfortable. It would be a several hour long train ride back to London so there was plenty of time to chat. Unlike how we met though, Hermione sat next to me comfortably as she read her book happily. I smiled slightly and leaned my chin on my hand which was resting on the window ledge. I looked at the students pass by as they hurried to find their places. It wasn't long before the train departed, and I took one last look at Hogwarts in the distance. It would be around half a year before I would return to this place. It was going to get very busy from now on. There was a lot to do in the coming years. 
It was constant busyness. Going to America, getting the key without being caught, coming back, dealing with the issue at Hogwarts, devouring the Horcrux successfully without repercussions. And then there was the vault to get into. Those were just the most immediate things. There was still a ton to do. The plan was set in motion the moment my foot landed in Hawaii, and I was looking forward to it. I talked to Hermione as much as I could since I wouldn't be seeing the nerdy girl for a long time. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that I would miss her. I would not be able to send letters to her since sending letters by all was impossible. I would be out of contact with her the moment I set off to Hawaii. So, I made sure to spend time with her as I did over the past week. But it was short-lived as she fell asleep not long after. Her head rested on my shoulder and she quietly slept. I only sighed and looked out the window and admired the steep mountains, the waterfalls, and the wildlife that could be briefly seen before vanishing off to the side. The train continued forward until we arrived back in London. I looked at the still sleeping Hermione and gently woke her up. She looked around in confusion and then at me. There was silence before she realized what happened. I looked at her calmly as she blushed slightly before fixing her messy untimable hair. We have arrived, get yourself ready, we'll be getting off soon, I told her. She nodded silently and looked out the window and saw the busy street before it was covered by brick and then a colorful train station came into view. Before the train had even stopped Hermione and I had already packed up and stood right outside the door. That way we could avoid the crush from the students swarming out. The door slid open and we hopped out, took our luggage quickly and stood to the side. It was just in time, as the students rushed out like a plague of locusts. We went through the wall and appeared back in the muggle world. It had been so long since I had come back. And the first thing I saw was black and white, there were no vibrant colors, none of the usually cheerful and vibrant life that could be seen daily in the magical world. You noticed it too, right Tom, asked Hermione with a helpless smile. I nodded. The muggle world really was, bland and boring. That is the appeal of the magical world, she said, that is why wizards are so clueless about the outside. The few that have ventured out for long periods of time only did so once. It is too colorless, boring, and plain. I feel detached from this place, even when I lived here all my life, she said with a complicated expression. I understood her perfectly, I almost wanted to return right this moment. It was simply a contrast of night and day. We shook our heads and walked side by side as we head out. We had told our parents when we would be arriving, and it didn't take long for me to spot Luke who was leaning against his Mercedes-Benz in a long coat. His trimmed beard and black hair with framed glasses made him look smart and handsome. Hermione's parents weren't far away, and when all three of them saw us they walked towards us. We soon became a party of five. Chapter 85, alluding to something more. Tom, said Luke as he embraced me in a tight hug. I hugged him back with a smile. How have you been old man, I said jokingly. Hmph, who are you calling old, kid, he said raising his chin proudly. His actions made me laugh. It brought back the many memories of such conversations. Hermione hugged her parents tightly for a moment before letting go. Tom, these are my parents, Jean and Paul Granger. Dad, Mom, this is Thomas Knight, my friend and classmate, she said happily. I walked over and shook hands with Paul. Nice to finally meet you, Mr. Granger, your daughter speaks very highly of you and your no-sugar policy, I said with a chuckle. It was a good icebreaker as Paul laughed before looking at the now embarrassed Hermione. Is that so, I'm glad she talks about me. It is a pleasure to meet you as well Mr. Knight. Our little girl has mentioned you quite a few times, he said with a smile. I was surprised and looked towards the now completely red-faced Hermione. Huh, who would have thought? I said teasingly. This is my father, Luke Knight, I said introducing Luke to them. It didn't take long for them to begin to chat which allowed me and Hermione to say our goodbyes. I approached her only to receive a light punch to the arm. Must you embarrass me so much Tom, she said with a pouting face. But it soon turned into a giggle as she hugged me. I reciprocated and leaned into her ear. Beware of its gaze, use mirrors, I whispered vaguely. She tried to let go but I held her in place. I will not be seeing you for a long time Hermione. Promise me you will work hard and stay alert while at school, I said solemnly. She was silent for a while. I I promise, she said softly. I will see you soon, try not to kill those two idiots while I'm gone, okay. She nodded weakly. I ruffled her frizzy hair into a mess before turning around and walking away. Luke and the Grangers were surprised by our little interaction, but I only nodded, said my farewells and walked away with Luke who had a grin on his face. Paul had an odd smile and Jean giggled just like Hermione would. Me and Luke soon got in the car and drove away. Hermione stared at Tom's back before raising her left hand to her head. She stomped angrily as she tried to fix her hair while glaring at the car he got into. But all that vanished when she thought about what he said just before. What did he mean by that? She mumbled as she bowed her head in thought. Once again, Tom seems to know things that don't make sense, and he mentioned school. It might be connected. Knowing him, he should know something I don't. TCH, just like him to keep it a secret. Let's just hope that he's wrong and nothing will happen at school next year, she murmured in thought with a slight frown. She did not want problems since that would be troublesome, especially with Tom being gone. She once again steeled her resolve to study offensive magic. The Grangers looked at their daughter with a helpless smile before ushering her into the car and driving away in the opposite direction. That would help with the situation. This way, she would at least remember my words when the Basilisk was unleashed. Naturally, I would get there pretty early into the attacks. 
but in case I'm delayed, the latest I'll come back is January, since at that point I'll just blow a hole in the school and steal the key, time waits for no man, but let's hope it doesn't come down to that, I didn't know you decided to start socializing, and even more so with a girl, finally, I say, you were always such a loner, let's just hope she's just as studious as you are, he said helplessly, I almost choked on the water I was drinking, Luke looked at me questioningly, if only you knew, if you're calling me studious, then I don't really know what you would call her, I said with a chuckle, Luke was surprised when he heard that, you aren't lying, are you, as if the one girl you meet just so happens to be just like you, he said sceptically, well, that's how it is, take it or leave it, but moving on to another subject, I have something serious to talk to you and Diana about, I said solemnly, Luke's smile fades slightly and he nodded seriously, it was a nice calm car ride home, the scenery didn't change since I had left, and everything was the same, the park near my house was still full of kids, albeit different ones from when I was there last since most of them had grown up by now, there were parents pushing swings and people running around, it wasn't weird since everyone wanted to make the most out of the summer holidays, we soon arrived back home and upon seeing Diana, I gave her a big warm hug before sitting down at the table, Diana who was informed that I had something serious to say sat at the table with Luke and quietly stared at me, seeing this I nodded, Drac cast that magic concealing spell, I want to use magic, I said in my head, got it, I pulled out my wand to the surprise of Luke and Diana and cast the Muffliato spell. They looked at me questioningly since they didn't see or feel any change. Don't tell me you're failing classes. Luke joked. I smiled before shaking my head. No, it was a muffling spell, this way our conversation will not be heard by unwanted characters, I explained. Why would you need that? He asked. There shouldn't be anyone listening in to our house of all houses, he asked sceptically. You can never be too safe. Plus, what I'll be saying next is incredibly sensitive. Chapter 86, A History Lesson with the Family. Okay, go on, we're listening, said Diana with a nod. Well, how to start? I remember everything. The day I was born, the months I spent with my real parents, and I especially remember their deaths, I paused to let them digest that. Luke's face fell drastically, Diana had tears welling in her eyes. So you're saying, you remember everything. Luke repeated my words. Yes, I know that I am adopted, I know that my father was Lance, and my mother was Nina, I also had a brother named Theo, all of which were killed by certain people because of my last name, Pendragon, and the secret they carry. I said slowly and calmly, I understand why you put up this spell, said Luke with utmost seriousness, I nodded at his words, does this have something to do with why you asked to go to Hawaii, asked Diana, I nodded once again, correct, that is why, but there is also another matter that's connected to that one, I must transfer to the magical school in America for a special reason, I paused for a moment, I appreciate all which you have done, you cared for me, and raised me as your own even when I wasn't, I said truthfully, I owed them a lot, to us, you are one of our own, Blood has nothing to do with it, said Diana emotionally. Luke nodded at her words. And I thank you for that. I will not say more until after I have placed a series of charms on you both. They will hide the information I will tell you later from others. It will also stop you from accidentally spilling them. I spoke. It was very similar to the Fideliu's charm, but it was simpler. It was actually a series of charms, one on the tongue, and one on the brain. The charm placed on the tongue would stop the speaker from divulging certain topics. It reminded me of the ceiling just so Danzo placed on his root soldiers from Naruto. The charm placed on the brain would stop the target from spilling the selected information via mind reading. Drac said that it worked the same just that it was much more impractical if used for mass spreading of information. But since that was not the case it was perfect to use. Luke and Diana nodded seriously, they understood that the magical world was not something to be trifled with. Seeing them agree I got straight to work. I placed the charm on both their tongues and specified the information to be blocked. Naturally, it was anything relating to the Pendragon family, or my real origins. As soon as they were completed, I tried to get them to speak about it with our neighbor since it was the only other person that was easily accessible. It wouldn't work if they spoke to me since I specified that they could speak freely in my presence about such subjects. And the result was perfect. Diana who was chatting with the neighbor's wife couldn't speak a word about my origins or the Pendragon family when she tried to bring it up. It was like it was stuck in her throat. Luke did the same with the husband, but it provided the same result. Success. I was very happy with it since that was on more barrier stopping others from knowing my secrets. I then proceeded to the most important one. The charm that was placed on the brain. Naturally there was no harm in it, and it was also done smoothly. The great thing was that it was more theoretical than it was practical. That was why I didn't need much time to get it right when Drac passed me the information. When I tried to use legilimency I was easily able to penetrate their minds, but I was not able to see anything relating to the Pendragons. Even Lance my father which I knew they knew about was not there. It was like they never met. I was very content with the results since with this, they could not be in danger in case they were probed. Having done all of that we sat back at the table, redid the Muffliato spell and began to talk. The secret of the Pendragon family is that we have a dragon sealed inside of a descendant at any one given time. His name is Drac and he has been with my family since several millennia ago. He was sealed inside of me automatically when my father died that night, I said pausing for a moment. Luke was downcast at the mention of Lance's death. Diana patted his shoulder softly. 
I then began to talk to them about our history, and how my family lived and what happened to the other dragons. It was not until the sun had set when the talks finished. So, you're telling me that you are like some type of dethroned royalty, asked Luke incredulously. I never really thought about it that way. I guess you could say that in some way, we were the first official wizarding family, and in terms of power, well, Liam was the strongest, but it all went downhill with his death. But that isn't the point. The reason I'm telling all of this is so that you understand why I need to go to America. I explained that it had something to do with Drac and getting more control over my power. I explained that the reason I was going to Ilvermorny was for the key and that I would be back by January. What surprised me was that they were supportive of it. Luke who noticed this shook his head. Don't be so surprised. You have trusted us with such a secret, the least we can do is support you. We also understand the importance of the key to you and your family and whatever it is that's hidden in that vault. So go for it. We will provide you with the funds to buy all you need for schooling there. Thank God these magical schools are actually free though, said Luke with a sigh of relief. That was one thing that took me by surprise when I found out. It seemed that the magical schools in American and England at least, were free. The ministry provided the funds for the operation of the school. A very odd way since most people would go down the route of a profiteer. And having hundreds of magical kids entering your school must have the potential to rake in some serious cash. Who knew what was going on the heads of these wizards? Chapter 87, Differences. After finishing our talk, we had dinner. It was a warm feeling, spending time with loved ones. But it was difficult, seeing them as my parents, and that was why I always addressed them by their names. It would be well before I would accept that. It wasn't something that could be rushed. If it didn't come generically then it wasn't worth saying at all. I lay in my bed thinking about our conversation. I thought that they deserved to know, or at the very least have a look into what my family was like. They did not ask how I knew so much since Drac was there inside of me. Naturally he was the one who gave me this information as well. So, we have a couple of days before we head off to Hawaii, make sure to buy clothes that fit you, or did you forget? Said Drac with a soft chuckle. I face palmed when I heard that. I completely forgot about it. That was most definitely something that I would need to fix as soon as possible. The night went by peacefully. The morning sun acted like my usual alarm clock as the rays touched my face. I woke up to the nostalgic sound of Diana singing with the smell of freshly brewed coffee wafting in in waves through the gap beneath my bedroom door. I only came to realize how much I missed the little stuff. Like Arya getting fed by Diana in the kitchen acting aloof and prideful, Luke reading the morning newspaper with his reading glasses while taking a sip from his coffee absentmindedly, only to be burned because it was too hot. This happened every morning, yet it never annoyed me. I washed my face and when I lifted it up from the sink, I saw a more mature face looking back at me. I still had the childishness on my face but there was less of it. I was also taller than before which was apparent from the long sleeve shirt that only reached three quarters down my forearm. I had to roll it up to make sure it didn't look too out of place. We ate breakfast before going shopping. I had clothes I needed to buy. I made sure to buy separate ones that were a size or two bigger in the event that I grew than expected. The reason was simple. I was going to make the potion again, so there was some expected growth to be seen. Also on that point, my muscle definition was an interesting thing to see. For a 12-year-old, I had a fair bit of muscle. There was still that skinny look since children my age wouldn't gain much muscle until two or three years from now but seeing the effects of the potion I wouldn't be surprised if I saw that being sped up by at least a year. As I thought about this, we walked into the first clothing store. For the next four hours, we meticulously searched for all the articles of clothing I could need. It was exhausting. I didn't understand how women did this and enjoy it. When I got back home, I sat down and watched some TV with Luke before heading up to my room for some acclumency and legilimency training. It was tedious and boring but that was the price to pay in order to see results, but they were very important to me so it must be done. While I was doing that, I was deep in thought about the differences between England and American. Starting with the lack of communication between the two. The first indication that America is a world away from Britain is when Newt Scamander came off an ordinary muggle steamship and having to go through customs. The meaning of this is not in what we can see, but what we don't see, any magical transportation system between Great Britain and North America. There is evidently no formal cooperation between the two wizarding worlds, no flu network, no night bus or an equivalent magical ship that would sail to and from the two countries no Hogwarts Express, no transcontinental brooms, magic cabinets or enchanted paintings affording easy movement back and forth across the Atlantic. It is also known that America was socially isolationist prior to the Second World War, and something of a rival with the British Empire for world leadership as well, suggesting that the American mind didn't quite know what it thought about itself at the time, let alone about distant Europe. All these things are communicated by the simple fact that Newt Scamander has to use muggle money and take a muggle ship in order to reach New York from London. This was all I could glean from the movies which gives rise to the question of why didn't America step in when a huge threat like Voldemort appeared. The answer was simple. They knew and didn't do anything about it. They were probably waiting for both parties to be weak before swooping in to save the day. What this would achieve is simple. The British Empire would owe a massive debt of gratitude to their American counterpart. Something that would be detrimental to our growth. But that was all speculation. Maybe they're dealing with their own problems as well. This leads to political differences between the two countries. 
The politics of the wizarding community in America are also presented as more shrill, more strident, than that of the British wizards. If I was to expect a less authoritarian equivalent in America to the draconian Ministry of Magic in London, with more personal freedoms, my expectations would soon be set straight. Chapter 88, Differences Part 2 The Magical Congress of the United States, MACUSA, is no less obnoxious to the lives of its citizen clients than its UK equivalent, and each community has its clear issues. America, it seems, is as tumultuous in its wizard nomage relations and its religious fanatics as British wizardry is in its blood purity issues. From the English viewpoint, America is an assuredly violent place. Along with the fetish for guns and the culture of mass shootings is its long, horrific history of mistreating its Native Americans. It dispossessed them and forced the survivors onto reservations in the infertile West, where most continue to live at a subsistence level, struggling to hold on to their dignity and way of life. Take, for example, the cautionary tale of one community that struggled to exist in the midst of America's majority society, the Cherokee Nation, and the fate that befell it. The Cherokee Nation early adopted white ways to earn the respect of its neighbors in the state of Georgia. It soon had its own language in print, its own newspaper and a capital, New Dakota. Its citizens lived in proper houses and farmed like white people. The Supreme Court of the U.S. even recognized its right to exist. Yet white Georgians, envying the prosperity of their Indian inferiors, began entering the Cherokee Nation at will, forcing families from their homes at gunpoint, and taking their lands and possessions. In their minds, the Indians were subhuman, therefore lacked either rights or the protection of the law. The American president at the time, Andrew Jackson, defied the Supreme Court and used the U.S. Army, a virtual gang of thugs with a flag to provide the appearance of legitimacy, to force the Cherokee onto a long journey on foot to a barren reservation in Oklahoma. Thousands died on this Dolorous March, which is remembered as the Trail of Tears. A similar cautionary tale is the fact that it took a civil war, with hundreds of thousands dead, to force the southern United States to give up the institution of slavery. Even after the South was defeated on the battlefield, black folk continued to be terrorist by mob violence, subjected to legal apartheid by Jim Crow laws that created a system of separate schools, bathrooms, and water fountains, a requirement to sit in the back of buses, in separate parts of restaurants if they were allowed in at all, and so on. The open discrimination continued until the civil rights movement of the 1960s and to some extent continues even when I was alive in my past life. While the American wizarding community would not have been ethnically distinct, it would have offended another powerful force in American society, evangelical Christianity. Unlike England, America has a large population of religious fundamentalists. The vast majority of these folk are peaceful, of course, yet in this brand of faith, witchcraft is equated with Satan worship and is stigmatized as a threat to Christian society. Thus, in order to protect themselves, American wizards take their own hard line against relationships with the nomage, relationships that could expose and thus endanger the very existence of their own wizarding world. They are keenly aware of what Americans have historically done to minorities that refuse to be assimilated, and to perceived threats to the Christian way of life. This led to the implementation of and strictly regulated law the inhibited magical people from marrying nomash and giving birth to offspring. This vastly differs from England where there is no such law, and wizards and witches are allowed to marry muggles even though some selective families of purist tendencies find it appalling and unbecoming. All I could say was that each country had its issues, and that it's difficult to know just how I'll be treated since I'm still under the facade of a muggle-born wizard. Either I'll be subjected to intense scorn and distrust, or I'll be ignored and have little interaction with others. It is all up in the air. But if I had to pick one, it would take the latter in an instant. Naturally, I could be generalizing this a bit, since even here in England there are families and wizards who like muggles and their magical children, case, and point the Weasleys. There was also the chance that everything could turn out differently. When I get to Ilvermorny the teachers would have already been informed of my attendance and background. Therefore, they might be understanding of my differing values. Naturally, the opposite could happen and would most definitely happen. That a teacher or two would fail to restrain their radical ideologies and try to apply them on me. Many things will be shown to me in the coming weeks and months. It will be fascinating to see how they will act. The next few days went by quickly. I reminded Hermione to take the potion via letter and wrote about some other random trivial things. I soon got a letter back from her wishing me good luck and a safe return. I closed the letter and left it on my desk before walking out of my room. I needed to head to Diagon Alley since there was something I needed to buy. Mainly just an item with bigger expansion space. I didn't want to have to carry around a trunk everywhere. Having a small item like a bracelet would be better. I had ordered one tailor made to my specification as soon as I woke up the day after my return. I was now going over there to pick it up. I asked for a bracelet since carrying anything like a bag seemed like a chore. So, a bracelet seemed fitting. Plus, it was easier to keep track of compared to a bag or trunk and less conspicuous to carry as well. Chapter 89, Off to America. It didn't take long for Luke to arrive near the leaking cauldron. He stopped a block away since the streets any nearer were full. It wasn't that much of a problem for me though and I swiftly arrived at the door. Upon entry what greeted me was the same gloomy, run-down place full of odd people. I saw the bartender Tom with a towel in one hand and a glass cup in the other like always. I nodded at him before walking into the small, secluded and unkept little yard with an out-of-place brick wall. I remembered which bricks and the order they needed to be pressed in from McGonagall. 
I tapped them with a stick that was conveniently in the corner and the same thing happened as it did more than a year ago. The wall began to rumble and shake before the once sturdy, cohesive bricks shifted and separated into an archway where they once again solidified. What appeared in my vision was the same busy streets of Diagon Alley. The swarm of wizards, witches, and children could be seen in all kinds of colorful attire. The contrast between the muggle world and the magical one was just too different. I squeezed my way through the crowd to the best of my ability and headed towards the shop I had visited some odd days ago. It didn't take long to get there and when I walked in, I saw the same old man by the counter tinkering with one of what I assumed to be his many projects or orders. He had brown hair with strands of white that streaked through every now and then. He had a slightly hunched figure and long fingers that held on to his wand like a pen. It seemed he was too immersed in his work since he didn't even realize I was there, even after the bell tied to the door rang. I decided to look around and wait for him to finish. Making expansion charms was a difficult process and one that required a lot of focus. One small distraction could be the deciding factor between a successful product and a failed one. It was about 10 minutes later when I heard him again. Sai finally done, such a tedious project, he said with a tired expression while rubbing his forehead as his other hand held his glasses. He raised his head to see me sitting on a chair off to the side. My, thank you for waiting young man. If I'm not mistaken you must be the boy who came the other day, he asked while looking at me. That is correct, I am here to pick up the object I had ordered, I said with a smile while nodding. Right right, that's right, I have it here, one second. He said before waddling to the back of his store. It seemed that being in the same position for a while was bad for his body, seeing how stiff his walking was. It didn't take long for him to come back with an obsidian black colored bracelet. There was nothing special about it if you looked at it without knowing what it was. I nodded contently when I saw it. After all, one of the specifications was to make it as simple and inconspicuous as possible. I would be storing a lot of things in it after all. I got up from the chair and pulled out a bag full of galleons. It was expensive, to say the least. 1000 galleons to be specific. Luke and Diana weren't happy with the price but got it for me as a way of making up for not getting me a birthday present. I was very thankful since 1000 galleons was a lot of money when converted into pounds. As soon as I handed over the money, I was given the bracelet which I didn't hesitate to put on. I thanked the old man and walked out before heading into an alleyway. I then proceeded to cast a quick charm on the bracelet. This charm was special since it was a sort of locking mechanism. I dripped a bit of my blood on the bracelet as soon as the charm was done being placed, it immediately seeped into the metal. This way, no one was able to access it without my permission. It could already do that without the charm but having extra countermeasures is always welcome. As soon as I was done, I walked out of Diagon Alley and out of the leaking cauldron and back into Luke's car. Twenty minutes later I was back at home packing my clothes and necessary things and placing them in my bracelet. It was one of the many times if was grateful to have magic. It was simply too convenient. The night was calm and after dinner, I head off to bed early. Tomorrow I would be heading to a new continent after all. And a lot of things were waiting for me there. The next morning was quick and slightly rushed. It was my first time on a plane in either one of my two lives and I was very excited. When I got there, immigration and customs were a pain since there was a special magical sector we needed to go to. We were intercepted by a man in a blue suit and tie. Excuse me, can you please come with me? He said calmly and politely. I simply nodded and Luke and Diana followed silently. Chapter 90, London Airport. We followed after him through a spare corridor that branched into a labyrinth of offices. I really didn't know how someone wouldn't get lost in here. Not long after we arrived at a very ordinary room that looked identical to the other 100 I saw while walking. A wooden table, comfortable leather chairs and bright lights hanging from the ceiling. The walls were completely white with nothing decorating them. It simply looked like an interrogation room. We sat down opposite the man after he indicated for us to do so. Thank you for your cooperation, it is necessary to go over the things that are brought by wizards when they are traveling. Security and all that. After all, as you might be aware of, even a single wizard can cause a lot of trouble. He said as he looked at me. My name is Matthew, and I will be going over your magical belongings. So, if you will, please present your magical objects including your wand, and place them here, he said calmly and patiently as he took out a metal tray. I nodded and took out my wand from its sheath and laid it on the tray followed by taking off my bracelet and placing it on the tray as well. The man looked at it as if expecting something more. That's it, my belongings are all in the bracelet, I informed. He looked at the plain unassuming bracelet in slight surprise. He then realized that it had an expansion charm in the gem that was on the bracelet. He nodded in understanding. I see, may I have your permission to access your belongings? I nodded and waved my hand over the bracelet deactivating the normal protective charm and the personally made one. Done, you can do with it as you please. He proceeded to pull out his wand and cast some sort of charm or spell to search the contents. I assumed it was a magic that searched for dangerous or suspicious artifacts containing magic. Guns would also be searched for. Even when in a magical world, guns are very effective. It took 30 seconds, and he retracted his wand from above the bracelet and nodded. He then did the same with the wand before placing the tray in front of me. Thank you for your patience, nothing suspicious has been detected and you are free to board the plane when it is time. Have a pleasant journey, he said with a smile before getting up. All three of us nodded and walked back under his guidance before heading to the gate where we would board our plane. I looked at the ticket which had gate 36 on it. 
It took about 10 minutes to get there. As in any airport, there was a ton of people. I also saw wizards being led by similar airport staff like the one that led us. Naturally, you wouldn't really know or pay attention to them if you weren't another wizard. It was evident by Luke and Diana's lack of reaction when they passed right by us. Some type of spell or charm I assumed. There was something like it in the library back at Hogwarts so it might be worth learning for instances where you don't want to be bothered in the muggle world. I think it was like a repellent charm or something. I'll make a mental note to search for it when I was at Ilvermorny. When we arrived at the gate and took a seat in some random empty chairs, I checked the time. There was still about 30 minutes until boarding time, if everything went according to schedule. There was literally nothing to do. And there were no bloody phones yet, since that was still in the midst of innovation. Right now, only the bulky almost brick-like phones were present. It wouldn't be until a decade later when the real phones appeared and even then, it would take yet another decade until we got good touchscreen ones, not the early shitty ones. As I was thinking about that, I got an idea about how to get money. I could invest in companies like Apple and Microsoft that were at the forefront of innovation in their respective markets. They were small right now, ready for the pickings. The reason was simple, pounds could be converted into galleons and vice versa, and money was needed in everyday life. I could get Luke and Diana a bigger house, better cars, and the sort. It all run on money. Even though me and Drac already had a plan on how to get large amounts of galleons, investing in the muggle world like the Malfoy family did would be smart. After all, having a continuous inflow of money was necessary. I will see if I can do something about it while I'm in America. As for why they would trust or even take a 12-year-old kid seriously, well, the Imperio curse does wonders for people. I could use the Imperius curse to take money from other families instead of going through so much effort in America, but I have some principles, I wouldn't stoop to such a low if I have a way to avoid it. That isn't to say I wouldn't if I had no other option, but since I did, I wouldn't have to. As for the conversion of money from American dollars to English pounds, the magical community doesn't really care. Goblins love money, doesn't matter in what form. The PA system sounded informing passengers that the plane at gate 36 was open and boarding would commence shortly. I was happy to hear that since sitting here doing nothing was definitely not fun. As for how I was going to get from American to England and back constantly, well, I was planning to make a port KA. There was never a stipulated maximum distance that one could take with one so why not? I would place one in America somewhere and carry the other in my bracelet for convenience. Chapter 91, Lift Off. The boarding finally started, and a long line of people were starting to queue up. The time taken to check the ticket and then proceed to weigh the bags took approximately 30 seconds per person. After a little while, it was finally our turn. The same process ensued, and we were soon given the all clear to board the plane. We walked through the portable corridor that connected the plane to the gate and arrived at the plane doors where two cabin crew members were in charge of directing people towards their seats. Good morning, may I please have your ticket, said the woman in a navy blue dress with a red scarf around her neck. Luke, Diana, and I handed our tickets to her and were soon directed towards our seats. As soon as I stepped onto the plane, a cacophony of noise engulfed my ears. The screaming of children as they were having a tantrum for God knows what reason, the sounds of a parent's reprimands, an old woman complaining about her back and so on. Any semblance of the peaceful and orderly boarding I had pictured in my head shattered into dust. I also noticed that the seats were clustered together, and the legroom was practically non-existent. The only exception was the front seats near the exits. Lucky bastards I thought. I hadn't even sat down yet, and I could already imagine the uncomfortable situation. I really couldn't wait to build the port Kea and learn to apparate. Finally finding the row my seat was in, it was by the window with Luke and Diana next to me. I was thankful since I saw a poor woman being seated next to a massive blob of fat that I assumed to be a man. He was literally spilling over into the next seat. I could only pity her bad luck. Since I didn't carry any light luggage, I simply sat down and looked out the window and observed the other giant white-winged mechanical monsters taking off one after another. It really was amazing how much progress humans can make in such a short time. I never really understood it. For centuries, humans had been at a standstill in terms of technology. But as soon as World War I started, it all exploded, everything began to appear. It was very interesting. This is not even taking into consideration the internet, the single, most important piece of technology invented by humans, and the computers and phones made to better harness it. It all developed in less than a century. It was simply amazing to witness. And now I would have a direct influence on its direction. The power of knowledge never ceased to amaze me. It really was like heaven and earth. As I was immersed in my own thoughts, the PA system within the plane sprang to life and the feminine voice of a stewardess came through. Good morning passengers, I would like to welcome you to one of the first 100 flights from London to America. We have only recently been open, and we thank you for traveling with us, she said to my shock. I just realized, in 1991, American Airlines bought the assets of TWA's operations at London Heathrow for $445 million. So, it was indeed right to say that I was on one of the first few flights between the two nations. Damn, that was very convenient, who knew I would get so lucky. I didn't really think about it much as the plane roared alive and began to move slowly but steadily towards the tarmac where it would fly off from. The trembling from the plane got more and more noticeable until I was forced to put my cup of water down since I failed to take a sip multiple times out of fear of tipping it on myself. 
Let's just say that the suspension system on these older models wasn't comparable to the newer ones later on. It didn't last long before the outside images began to speed past my window becoming in blur, and when the wheels left the ground, I felt a distinct sinking feeling in my stomach. It was weird but fun at the same time. It didn't last long however and soon went away and, in its place, blocked ears plagued me. It was due to the air pressure in the cabin changing rapidly. It was fine since it went away quickly too, but that didn't stop it from being slightly unpleasant. As soon as the plane stabilized at a certain altitude, I looked out the window to see nothing but clouds. There was no longer a city beneath my feet, I was flying, for the first time in my life. It was slightly scary, I don't really trust machines, since there can always be errors. I was kind of traumatized after watching a show called Air Crash Investigations. Let's just say that even if I was given a chance to fly in my past life, I would have declined adamantly. But I had magic and I had drac, I doubt that I would die even if I fell out of the plane. But that brought up a thought. Maybe I should go skydiving sometime, that should be incredibly fun to do. My thoughts trailed off for a while as I thought about that when I was awoken by the same feminine voice. You many take your seat belts off, but please, stay in your seats and do not leave unless necessary. If you need anything, please, raise your hand and one of us will do our best to help, she said warmly before disappearing somewhere. Chapter 92, Hotel. The plane ride was terrible. I really thought I had been missing something, but it seemed that I had actually been doing myself a favor. The overly tight seat belts that dug into your hips, the tasteless bag of peanuts that were half-crushed in the pocket seat in front of me, the cheap blankets that didn't do anything to keep you warm, even if I didn't need it was still appalling. The sound of poorly behaved children and parents lecturing them to no avail, the fucker who was constantly kicking my seat from behind, the gnawing irritation of constantly having to hear a screaming child in the row behind me, an old couple grumbling about the noise, the bored teen sitting in the row across from me listening to overly loud music in an attempt to drown out the increasing boredom visible on his face. Let's just say that it left much to be desired. Such a letdown. By the time the captain said something, it had already been eight and a half hours later. Hello everyone, we will be descending shortly, you may experience a bit of turbulence, but I assure you, that is normal, please, fasten your seatbelts and await instructions from the cabin crew, I thank you for flying with us, he said before the PA system cut off. I sighed in relief, it had been a terrible time. I had barely any sleep and my nerves were already worn out by the continuous kicking of the seat and children crying. But what really made me depressed was that there was still another flight to take. We would stop in Los Angeles before taking another six-hour flight to Honolulu. That was where my training would commence. The active volcano Kilauea was where Drax's trial would be held. He said that it wasn't necessary to go there specifically, but that it would provide the most benefit in one shot. As the plane descended, I felt slight weightlessness spread across my body, it was a pleasant experience that lasted a while. I could see the city from the window to my left, it was a marvelous sight to behold, tons of skyscrapers and hundreds of houses spread all over the place. As we went lower and lower, I was able to make out the Hollywood sign that stood proudly. It didn't take long for the wheels on the plane to land and a terrible shaking began to travel across the entire plane before slowly easing and eventually coming to a stop after the plane taxied its way over to the gate where we would be disembarking from. It wasn't until five minutes later when the cabin crew flooded into the aisles to make sure everything was alright before helping people with their stuff. It took ten minutes to get off the bloody plane due to the unorderly and pushy nature of some people who tried to cut in front in order to save some time. After arriving at Los Angeles's airport I found it to be, the same, nothing majorly different from the England one. The only major difference was maybe the number of fast food places littered everywhere. It wasn't for nothing that America had one of the highest rates of obesity in the world. As we passed through customs we were once again intercepted by a man in a business suit. Please follow me, he said courteously but sounded more like an order rather than a request. I simply shrugged and followed after him with Luke and Diana in tow. We soon arrived at a similar plane room that looked like a place where interrogations were held. Please sit down, I will be inspecting your belongings for any illegal magical artifacts or objects, he said monotonously before pulling out a tray. I placed my wand and bracelet on the tray and waited silently. The man gave me the same look as the guy from England. I explained the misunderstanding and the man proceeded to check everything. All clear, you can take your stuff back, may I ask what the purpose of your visit is, he asked. Vacation with my parents and I will be transferring to Ilvermorny School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, I explained patiently. The man looked surprised before looking at Luke and Diana. A magical wizard born of Nomaj parents, interesting, well, I hope you enjoy your stay, he said dismissively before leading us back to the main airport. He seemed to have glossed over the details since it clearly stayed I was adopted but who cares. After parting with the man, we ate something to fill our empty stomachs after the long flight and headed towards the hotel near the airport we had booked at a tourist store a couple of minutes ago. The major difference I noticed right away on the road was the way they drove. The steering wheel was on the left rather than on the right, and the roads were reversed. Since Luke wasn't confident in driving here, we took a taxi and made our way slowly towards the hotel. Upon arrival, we paid for the taxi and headed into the hotel where a staff member rushed forward to help us with our stuff. Luke and Diana were about to agree when I shook my head. Everything costs money here, it's not like England where people get paid a decent wage, no, here they are paid less than proper and survive off the tips customers give. I suggest we carry our own luggage. 
I explained. Luke and Diana were shocked by the difference and felt pity for the people who worked here. The man who was rushing over here to help us heard what I said and became indignant while glaring at me. I simply smiled back before walking past him as if he didn't exist. Money didn't grow on trees, he had no one to blame but his shit government for the way they run things. America left much to be desired when it came to the quality of life. Their healthcare system was absolute trash, the rich get richer while the poor get poorer, it was simply a mess. Even in my past life, America was simply a shithole advertised as the promised land full of opportunity only to kick you right back out the door when it had no room for you. Places like Australia, Switzerland, and so on were the real places of comfort and a place I would trade America for in a blink of an eye. As I thought about this, we reached the reception and checked in before heading to our room where we changed clothes and decided to look around. We only had one day to spare since we would be departing for Hawaii tomorrow morning. And, this is the MC opinion. It is understandable if it conflicts with yours. That is okay. Chapter 93, Arriving in Hawaii. Walking out of the hotel after leaving our stuff in our room, we hopped on a sightseeing bus and looked around all of Los Angeles. We went to Griffith Observatory, which was a cool experience, then there was the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Later we went to the Santa Monica Pier since it was a fairly hot day, and finally had dinner in a fancy restaurant which was amazing. The food was great, the music being played was appropriate for the fine dining and the people around were respectful and talked in hushed voices. The whole tipping thing was getting annoying, but I felt bad for the people that put so much effort in. Luke and Diana felt even worse and left a generous $50 tip when we left. We arrived back at our room and fell asleep almost instantly. The next morning, the sound of cars going past and police sirens every now and then made it chaotic. But luckily it wasn't so bad at night which was the main point. We packed our stuff, got changed into fresh clothes and traveled towards the airport again. It took a while before we were able to board the plane since there were some delays due to inspections. It couldn't be helped, better that than dying. When we finally boarded, there were a ton of jolly people on the plane. Halfway through the flight, they began to sing happy songs of all kinds, everyone was joining in, and it was a lively atmosphere. It was most definitely not as annoying as the flight I had before. This one I actually enjoyed. When the plane finally landed the song stopped, much to the disappointment of the entire plane. It was a festive atmosphere. I was also hoping for more, but nonetheless, we must move on. Our group of three got off the plane and exited the airport after all the security checks and whatnot. What was crazy was the humidity and heat in Hawaii. As soon as I walked out of the airport the cold air blasting out from the air conditioners stopped and was overcome by the sweltering wave of hot air. Well, I assumed it was hot since Luke and Diana were already sweating. After what seemed to be hours, we got to the hotel. Luke and Diana rushed out of the hot and sticky taxi as fast as they could. It seems that the heat was too much for them. Once again, the benefits that Drac provided were coming in handy. It was like I had an inbuilt air conditioning unit. By the time I took all the luggage Diana and Luke brought out of the taxi's trunk, I found them nowhere to be seen. When I looked at the hotel entrance, I saw them inside with joy on their faces. The fuckers ditched me for some cold air. Where was the loyalty? When they realized I was looking at them, they had the audacity to rush me before vanishing further inside. I stared at their suitcases, tempted by the though of leaving them here to be stolen, but I took it back, that would be more of a hassle later. I begrudgingly dragged the suitcases inside before heading to where Diana and Luke were seated comfortably with drinks in their hands. Sorry about that Tommy dear, but it can't be helped, said Diana with an awkward and apologetic smile. That was what she called me when she was apologizing. And me being the dumbass that I am, always let her have her way. Simply for the fact that she was scary when she was angry, just like Hermione. I swear they would be best of friends. Those two sadistic women should never meet. Drac make sure to remember that in case it slips my mind later, I said frightened at what they would unleash. Luke nodded robotically, but when he saw my face, he smiled knowingly and gave me a pitiful look. I threw this whole thing to the back of my mind and looked at the inside of the hotel. For some reason, they decided that having a palm tree inside the lobby was a great idea. It even had coconuts. The staff wore floral shirts with white short and sandals with a necklace made of white and yellow plumerias. The smell of flowers followed them wherever they went. There was a small indoor waterfall off to the side in a corner. It was quite the sight to behold. As we got to the desk the receptionist raised his head and greeted us warmly. Aloha, how can I help you today, he asked. We are here to pick up the keys to our rooms, said Luke. The man asked for his name before nodding and searching for it. He soon nodded again. Got it, all clear, here are your keys, your rooms are 309 and 310, he said happily. We thanked him and walked towards the elevator that led to the third floor. With a bing the door slid open and a wide corridor was in sight. Red carpet that had a smell of flowers, dark brown wooden doors with plagues on them could be seen evenly spaced out. The lighting was very good due to one side being completely covered in glass, from which you could see a massive garden full of flowers and palm trees. It was a very innovative idea, much to my liking. We didn't take long to find our rooms, room 9 was Luke and Diana's and number 10 was mine. I slotted the key Luke gave me into the keyhole and pushed the door open. What greeted me was a brightly lit room due to the sun shining in through the sliding door next to the bed. The balcony could be seen behind the bed and past the sliding doors which gave view to the massive beach and the volcano I would be training at. 
It was a couple hundred kilometers south of Honolulu but that wasn't a problem. That was the reason I asked for my own room. The trial had a special way to access it, which involved creating a special magic circle only no to the dragons. It would take a while to set up and would require a lot of concentration. Anyone coming in or out would disrupt my flow, but, when it was done, it would allow one person to travel there and back once. So, I would be stuck there for two weeks which was when the holidays would end. Luke and Diana knew about this and simply took it as a vacation for themselves. A justly deserved one considering they raised a child for 11 years without going anywhere. Raising children was expensive. Chapter 94, Skipping Stones. I got dressed in a floral shirt which was way too different from the dark colors I would usually wear. But what surprised me the most was that I actually liked it. With my black shorts and slide-ons I stepped out the door to see Luke and Diana in similarly bright outfits. Luke had something on that was similar to me and Diana was in a pretty white summer dress. I really wanted to have one good day with them, so we decided to have a walk along the beach. I lagged behind to not ruin the two's romantic mood I felt brewing. I even saw Luke's thankful look. It seemed that not all was okay with the two. Marital issues sometimes happen, not everyone was perfect. Sometimes all that was needed was a change of scenery. I simply picked up some stones and attempted to make them skip across the water's surface. Stupid of me to try since you needed semi-still water. It's hard when you throw it at what seems to be a still patch of water only for a wave to surge out of nowhere, effectively swallowing your stone hole. After a few attempts to no avail, I simply threw all the stones into the water in anger and stormed off. Who needs to be good at stone skipping? But just a few steps ahead of me, a seven-year-old was doing it effortlessly. He was like a machine gun. One after the other, the stones continued to skip at least five times before sinking. As if that didn't piss me off enough, the kid turned my way and smiled arrogantly before continuing. I secretly cast the Confindus charm which made him overswing hitting his dad who was nearby. I laughed to myself while walking past him. TCH, so petty, what are you, five, asked Drac mockingly. What would you know, you're stuck inside all day, I bet you can't do it either. I said, not giving in. Pfft, sure sure, I definitely can't he said before I suddenly felt disconnected from my body. Drac actually took over my body. As I looked at his actions, I saw what it was like where Drac dwelled all the time. Dark and empty, there was nothing here. Except, a couch? I was shocked, but before I could think further, I heard a loud victorious laugh echoing inside the space. I quickly looked over to see Drac skipping the stone at least 20 times. I couldn't believe it, was that even possible? No shit it's possible, I'm doing it right now. Jealous yet? He asked with a smirk. TCH, it's just skipping stones on water, no big deal, I said with annoyance, yet there was a part of me that was jealous. Disadvantage of always being the best at everything. It's hard to take a loss. Whatever he said before sitting down. I wondered what he was doing when a small dragon appeared and sat on the couch comfortably. I stared at it in shock. Why was it so, cute? It was adorable, big round eyes, small wings, it was like a cute toy. Drac who was waiting silently suddenly realized an issue, he looked over in my direction and jumped up instantly. The cute dragon was no more, and a towering giant stood in its place seething with smoke and flame. You did not see anything, he said with extreme anger. That would have completely scared me before, but now, I couldn't stop laughing. Tears were threatening to slide down my cheeks. It was too funny, Big Bad Dragon was actually a small lizard. Before long I found myself laughing in my body again. I don't know when it happened, but everyone was staring at me weirdly as I laughed to myself. Forget you saw anything he said angrily. How can I forget? That is stuck in there forever, I said with a laugh before catching up to the now lovey-dovey duo. Drac sighed slightly before staying quiet. I just picture a small dragon comfortably sitting on a couch eating some chips while watching what I did or going over the memories of my past life. Let's just say I watched a huge number of movies. Drac who was sitting on the couch with a bag of chips shuddered slightly before realizing what Tom said. He looked at what he was doing and then at what he was watching. He was watching Home Alone too. He only shook his head before immersing himself in the movie. Kevin was throwing a brick down on Marv. Drac laughed out loud. I suddenly felt like I was missing something fun, but I couldn't quite grasp what. I could only shake my head and go about my day. It went pretty fast after that. We went to the garden for a stroll, watched a movie at a nearby movie theater and had dinner in a roofless restaurant. The food was delicious and eating under the stars gave it a magical feeling. I don't know why but I was a sucker for the stars. Afterwards, I spent some time in Luke and Diana's room talking about trivial stuff. I'll be gone for two weeks, remember to have fun. Don't worry about me, I'll be fine, I reassured them. They were slightly worried, but that was what parents were for, so it was mostly unnecessary. Sure, there was a risk of dying or being severely injured, but if I think I'll get injured, most likely, I will. Words had power after all. And, tomorrow there will be a five-chapter release. Look forward to it. Thank you for reading thus far. Hope you're enjoying it. Chapter 95, Sword on the Throne. I closed the door on my way out as I exited Luke and Diana's room. I no longer had any reservations about the trial. It must be done so that our plan can proceed. The trial involved a magical circle, so that is what I'll be focusing on from now on. It involves a couple of charms. One of them involves a teleportation charm. An extremely rare and difficult charm to acquire. Drac had learned it many years ago and used it for this trial. 
Sadly, it wasn't a long-distance charm, or I could have used that instead of a portkea, but it was what it was. Next, there was a linking charm, one that used the magic of the user to set up a pathway between two places. Drac explained that since he was fused within me since birth, my magic has taken some of his characteristics. This wouldn't happen normally which meant that the others would have to simply let Drac infuse his magic into it. It wasn't that big of a difference since it didn't take much time either way, but it was interesting to know that the time period in which Drac is placed, affects people differently. It seems that a lot of benefits were associated with growing up with one inside of you. I pulled out my wand and began to inscribe the charms into the floor. It was a very archaic and dated method of doing charms but brought a much greater stability to the overall magic circle. Something similar to this was the engraving of the expansion charm rather than just casting it into an object. The circle would also turn invisible when it was not active, that was useful since the cleaners at the hotel would come in regularly. It took about 5 hours to complete. The beginning stages were rough since I was assimilating knowledge as I inscribed, and it failed a couple of times. When I finally got over the initial hurdle, the immense concentration began to take a toll on my mind and body. Right at the very end, beads of sweat dripped on the floor like a leaking tap. The last touches were being set when a muffled rumble could be felt under my feet. The magic circle lit up in various different colors as they followed the outlines and finally, a portal opened, through which I could see a dark cave with stone pillars. A massive amount of heat could be felt seeping through the portal. The smell of ash wafted in uninvited, forcing me to cover my mouth and nose. I waved my wand, odor sectum. The ashy smell that was everywhere instantly disappeared as a small membrane covered my nose and mouth. One of the many spells in the library at Hogwitz. As I looked in, I heard Drax's voice, go in, the portal won't hold on for long, unless you feel like walking back. I nodded and walked in through the purple portal that looked like a whirlpool. As soon as I stretched my hand out, it was like I was being sucked in by some force. I didn't resist and was soon engulfed before feeling weightless. It didn't last long before I felt a blast of heat smash into my face. Naturally, this would be lethal heat for any normal person since I was actually at the bottom of an active volcano. There seemed to be a room surrounded by lava and covered with incredibly detailed and confusing engravings. I could only assume they were there for multiple purposes, some of them being concealment from unwanted attention, heat absorption, and others. As I looked around at the dilapidated room full of cracks and broken pillars, I noticed a throne. On the throne, there was a sword. If it wasn't for the sword being in a place where it was eye-catching, I wouldn't have noticed it. It was pure black in color, odd red rings could be seen slightly glowing along the blade. As I walked over and attempted to reach out Drac immediately stopped me. Never touch that sword, it has killed several reckless people with a mere touch. All of them were the same as you, they attempted to touch the sword only to die he said in a grave voice. Why, what's its history? I asked with puzzlement. I felt a yearning for the sword. Like I needed to touch it. I know what you're feeling. This sword, was the evil part of me that my father had sealed in order for me to live peacefully amongst others. It was an intense ritual, and this carved out a big chunk of my power. Even though I was still the second strongest after my father, when I was whole, I could rival him. It is only due to my unwillingness to be consumed by my own darkness that allowed him to separate me in two. It has been sealed in here ever since I found him. It was killing everything that touched him as he tried to find a worthy wielder, but no one has been able to withstand his power. Never, I repeat, never. Touch this sword for it will be the end of us both he said with an amount of seriousness and graveness I had never heard from him before. What a party killer, my boring and depressing other half. Why must you ruin things for everyone? I just want to be free. You might like being locked up inside of others, but I don't, I've been stuck in this fucking sword for several millennia, and no one has enough strength to wield me before falling flat on their faces. Yelled a voice incredibly similar to Drax. Hmph, <laughs> maybe if you didn't suck them dry of all their magical essence, you could have gotten out of here centuries ago said Drac in annoyance. Huh? You know just as well as me that it doesn't work like that? Who are you trying to fool? The boy? Huh? The boy does seem promising, maybe more so than that other guy. Hmm, no, he will die if he attempts it now. You need to get stronger he said calmly. Hmm, why are you in such a good mood? You're never like this said Drac with heavy traces of astonishment and surprise in his voice. Like I said before, I'm sick of being stuck here looking at the same stone walls over and over again. Plus, the boy seems very promising he said. Chapter 96, History Lesson Part 1. What's your history? Can you go into detail? I asked. Don't answer that a clee. Drac yelled suddenly. Hmm, why not? Haven't you told him already? It asked back. A clee? Who's that? And told me what? I asked in confusion. You mean you don't know? Drac hasn't told you, it asked with a laugh. He told me that your father separated you because you wrecked too much havoc, I asked while frowning. Something wasn't right here. It goes far deeper than that. And it's also connected to your family after all. What surprised me the most is that you're on such good terms with him. Given that he was the reason your family was hunted down for centuries his revelation shocked a puzzled me. Noticing my puzzlement, the sword began to laugh. What has he told you, it asked. I went on to explain my family history and Drax passed according to him. But as soon as I finished the sword began to laugh. It was a mocking one. I I can't believe he fed you that. Why are you so silent Drac, cat got your tongue. Since he isn't going to tell you the truth then I will. Boy did he pull the wool over your eyes kid. 
It has been a long time since I have laughed so hard. Okay, here goes. There was a time when the land was peaceful. So peaceful that the humans lived blissful and content lives. Wars were barely ever waged. The world only knew the light. But there must be balance. Lara, our father, was the dragon of light, and he, more than anyone, knew that balance wasn't achieved. Yet he didn't want it to be. For who would forsake peace for war and suffering? Unfortunately, he did not have a choice in the matter. His first child Zephyr, the fire dragon was born. Reckless and brave, he was our father's headache. Sapphire, the water dragoness was our father's heart. Hespot the sky dragon, the funny one of the family. And us, formerly known as Akli the abyss dragon. All four of us were our father's pride. But something was destined to go wrong. With our birth, human emotions previously hidden began to rise like the ocean tide. Greed appeared in the world and took root. Struggles for power, usurping of thrones, murdering of fathers and sons for mere coins. Rape, abuse, everything you could imagine appeared as suddenly as the rays of sun in the morning. Lara didn't know what to do. His dream of peace and bliss was shattered with our birth. Angered, he cast us out, never to return. That was when everything began to go downhill. The dream of a family, the dream of gaining our father's respect shattered into fine powder. And hatred took its place. Our powers which had been dormant for so long, burst forth like a volcano, ushering in a new era. The era of darkness. The once peaceful land was stained with the blood of innocence as men in metal marched with greed and malice in their eyes. The families who would once scream out the names of their loved ones happily were now nowhere to be seen. The homes that were once built to shelter their family now marked their tombs. The wails of the survivors as they scream out the names of their loved ones is all that echoes through the once happy streets. In order to feel love, you must bear the risk of feeling hate. And so, the cycle of pain commenced. Survivors grouped up, made their own kingdoms and waged wars on those who did them wrong. The survivors of that war would later build their own kingdom and the cycle continued. 300 years of non-stop war opened the eyes of Laro who was standing upon the tallest peak, as clouds of ash blocked out the sun the screams of innocence ringing in his ears like a sorrowful melody. He had finally realized what went wrong, but he was too late. The disaster he had once tried to avoid so much was ironically created by his own two hands. But he was too late to stop it, as his family was destined for doom. We didn't have love in our heart. How could we, when the only semblance of it was shattered by the hateful glare of our father and the disappointed looks of our siblings? They would all burn. A shadow loomed over the sky as a massive black dragon flew over the marching warriors as they waged war and pillaged the innocent. But we knew this wasn't going to harm our siblings. So, we decided to scale it up. We passed all kinds of magic on to the humans. Their bodies were somehow suitable to use it and soon, wizards began to sprout. What is now called jinxes, curses, charms and spells all came from us too. The abyss dragon was the progenitor of the magic that roams the seven continents. Destruction and chaos were the goal. And that was what we achieved. And pain was what we aimed to inflict upon our so-called family. We spread the news of dragons living in the mountains, and the greed that overflowed through them, clouded the minds of the once peaceful race. They waged war for the right to slay the dragons. And once the winner was decided, they marched to the highest peak where Zephyr the Great Fire Dragon rested, protecting the border between Asia and Europe. Groups of wizards hidden in the shadows and armies of soldiers led several assaults on Zephyr only for it to do no damage. Us true dragons were godlike existences after all. No type of magic or sword could ever kill us. But that wasn't the goal. Dragons didn't have unlimited magical energy. They would get tired as well. And Zephyr being the reckless fool that he was, didn't hold back in his attacks. Effectively draining his magical energy quickly. And once that happened, all we did was kill the remaining humans. Akli, thank our father you're here. These weird little ants had the audacity to attack me. And they have magic which only our race has. Do you know how they got it? He asked. Seemingly forgetting all about us being outcast centuries before. I haven't the faintest of clue, but you should take a rest. A permanent one. Zephyr nodded, seemingly agreeing before freezing, but it was too late. By the time he realized the wording was wrong, a massive black paw was already resting on his throat. W what are you doing? Release me? This is no time to be playing around. This is exactly why father outcasts you? Because you act like a child all the time? Come on, let go he said, but it was of no use. We only tightened our grip and stared into his eyes full of confusion. Let there be chaos we hissed and amassed black flames in our throat. We pried open his mouth and spat the fire straight down his throat. The devouring flames burned his body into nothingness with ease. Our brother's abilities relating to fire were transferred to us by our devouring ability. Chapter 97, History Lesson Part 2. We stared at the empty space where his body used to be. The black flames weren't a joke, nothing was left. But the hatred didn't die down. And so, we manipulated the negative emotions within the humans to hunt down Hespot, our naive, comedic brother. It didn't take long to find him. Ever since we knew him, he had always been the coward of the family. It took days to tire him out since he kept running away. Bang swoosh crackle. As soon as we finished killing the remaining humans, we met with our second big brother for the first time in centuries. I'm so glad you're here Ikli, although, you didn't have to kill them all off. I felt bad for them. They would have run away when their numbers dwindled enough he said with slight reproach. Clearly, he wasn't a fan of killing. Yes, it's all my fault, I'm to blame we said angrily. Relax will you? 
The stick is still as firmly lodged up your ass as last time we met he said with a laugh. But his laugh was short-lived as a massive black paw descended on his defenseless neck. A joke, Akli, a joke? Stop, or Zephyr will be mad. You know how reckless our big brother can get. I don't want to get scolded he said, slightly frightened by the idea. Ha, huh? that annoying loser is dead. And you're next, give him my thanks when you meet him we said. I distinctly remember us smiling. Sigh such good times. Anyway, back to the story. His pot was a dragon that controlled the weather and was a master of the elements. He was cowardly, yes, but his ability to create storms was unparalleled. After consuming him, a terrible drought ensued for several days. Only after we awoke did we find out that we had set off a countrywide heat wave that killed hundreds of thousands. But what did ants mean to an elephant? Setting their meaningless deaths aside we continued on towards our next target. Only Sapphire remained before we would fight father. We didn't use the same strategy as we did for our two brothers. After all, we were already strong enough to win in a head-to-head -head battle. So, we therefore flew directly towards where Sapphire dwelled. Inside a mountain covered by a waterfall. Upon entry, we saw Sapphire, sitting calmly on a rock staring at us with sadness. It seems, my dear brother, you are set on this path she said, with even more traces of sadness. You have brought it on yourself for the way you treated me. You have no one to blame but your dash. Our father. He is to blame she cut in. Father tried so desperately to elude the darkness that would eventually come, that he made it worse. I do not blame you for your actions my sweet little brother. For you, are the one I cherished the most she said as a tear slid down her face. Come, do what you set out to do, and let fate guide you. I pray for your salvation, lest you end up lost after all this is over she said before lying down, wide open and defenseless. In the moment, we felt nothing, no remorse, no pity. We didn't even register the words she said. We simply killed her. She neither screamed nor begged for mercy. She simply laid there, quietly. Sapphire was the dragon of wisdom and virtue, but it would hit us too late for it to take effect. In the moment, the urge to kill our father blinded us from seeing the wisdom our sister had imparted. Fueled with hate, we flew in Laru's direction with intent to kill, but he was no longer in his usual spot. He had fled. A trace was only found years later. A group of wizards and witches had set up the very first magical family, the Pendragons, a family that abstained from the material world, who wasn't influenced by our dark powers. For this reason, we knew that was where our father was hiding. Drowning in hatred and exhausted from all the searching, we decided to opt for a different approach. Manipulating the nature of humans, we made them search for the family, and slaughter them. All for the chance to get the powers of the dragons. The rumor worked and the humans flocked like wolves. It only took a few years to find them. But what astounded us, was that Laro, someone with immense self-respect, sealed himself in a human in an attempt to hide from us. But he didn't count on Liam's rashness which left too many clues. His constant battles and odd abilities soon gave him away. When we finally found him, we confronted them at the top of a mountain. Dragon of destruction and chaos, I have heard much about you and your despicable crimes, said Liam in a disgusted tone. Oh, if you know, then who gave you the courage to face me? Perhaps it was my cowardly father that hides within that worthless body of yours we said mockingly. Coward, that is a word reserved for those who kill their own family out of petty revenge, said Liam. You do not have the right to lecture me, child. Now, father, come out before I squeeze this little human into a pile of meat. Sigh after so long, why are you still so adamant on your need for revenge, asked Laro from within Liam. Being disowned has that affect on someone. Is there really no way to make you stop this senseless crusade of yours? After all, you have killed all of your siblings for your petty revenge, Sapphire. Oh my sweat girl he said with a deep sadness. Chapter 98, History Lesson Part 3. For a split moment, something within us attempted to burst out. The wisdom our sister had imparted, along with her words, hit us like a wall of bricks. The words of Hezpot, the reprimands of Zephyr, it all came rushing in. The words Laro said just then, awoke us from our rage. No, no, this doesn't end here. I screamed. I was the evil part born in the absence of love. But the rational side of Akli or how you call him, Drac, awoke from his slumber. All those years of being in control due to Drac's sadness collapsed like a castle built on foundations of sand. The words of Sapphire echoed in our head, slowly taking away the stronghold I once had over Drac's mind. That's when I realized things were no longer in my control. F father, H help me. Drac yelled in a moment of clarity. Laru saw the change in Drac's eyes and knew this was a rare chance for salvation. For all this madness to stop. He took over Liam's body and rushed forth, bursting with the power of light that seeped into our body. It started to travel around, trapping all my evil energy within a small place. I couldn't do anything, Drac was resisting my control. My own self, turning his back on me. The irony. When I had awoken, I was trapped in the sword Liam used to carry around his waist at all times. We were effectively separated. But it came at a price. Laru's death. He sacrificed himself in order to bring peace to the world, as atonement for his cowardly act. But Liam's life ended due to the pact he had made. Will this sacrifice of ours bring peace to the world? Liam asked as he rested his back on a rock. Energy draining out of him. Yes and no peace to the world it will not but balance it out it will. Light and dark must coexist in order for the world to live. My power will survive within my son. And the evil that once plagued him will be sealed inside of that sword. 
Destined to be forgotten he said weakly. I see, as long as my family is safe, that is all that matters, he said with a content smile. But Drac grimaced at his words. This caught Liam's attention. What? What's wrong? He asked. In my absence, the evil part of me used the humans to find you. You have been marked as the family that got a hold over the power of dragons. They will hunt your family for as long as that information exists he said with his head bowed. Liam flared up but didn't have the energy to move. Piece of shit. You doomed my family to eternal suffering because of your petty family squabbles. He bellowed with the last of his remaining strength. Lara and Drac both bowed their heads. Why you owe me a debt that cannot be paid with a single lifetime? You will protect my family until your dying breath, you hear me, he continued. I indeed owe you and many others for my wrongdoings. I will protect your family even if it costs me my life Drac said solemnly. But the degree to which my power can be used will depend on the aptitude of your descendants. If they don't use it wisely or are not good enough, even with my power, they will still die. You should know that he said truthfully. That is not of my concern. If my family is full of incompetent fools, then that is their fate. I just did the best I could to provide them with a safer route for survival, Liam said with a weak shrug. Then it is agreed Drac nodded. A Klee dash. No, that is a name that brought destruction to this world. I cannot live on with that name. My new name will be Draken. That is a name my sister heard somewhere. She liked that name he said with sadness. Drac then, you must train my powers well, for they will protect the family you are going to be with he said firmly. I'm sorry, but I don't find myself worthy of such power. Maybe when I think I'm good enough, worthy enough, will I use the power you bestowed me with. Your legacy Drac said. I see. Then a pray for the day you do so. I only wish I could be there to see that day he said. Before Drac could say anything, Liam began to fade. We have only known each other for a couple of years Lara, but boy were they good times. I only regret not having met you earlier, he said with a warm smile. Me too Liam, me too. That was all they said before Liam faded. A dragon could be seen streaking through the air. All the gloominess, heaviness, and evil in the world faded drastically. Families stopped frowning all day long, people stopped senselessly killing each other. Everything went back to how it used to be. Almost, there were some people that resisted it and continued to walk down the dark path. Humans still exhibited bad emotions, but they were not as pronounced. A sort of balance had finally taken effect. That is where the story ends brat, said the sword. Tom who was sitting down on the ground was speechless. Too many emotions coursed through his head. Anger, sadness, betrayal and so on. Why Drac? Why did you lie to me about your past all those years ago? I whispered in an attempt to suppress the feeling of betrayal and discomfort. I felt ashamed. Sure, maybe several millennia went by, but knowing you're the cause of the hate in the world, the reason so many more people had to die, plagued me. I have to wake up every day and see the faces of the family impacted by my destruction. The Pendragon family, a family so pure they didn't succumb to my influence. They used it to attempt good. To stop the wizards I had influenced. I am the reason dark magic was born. I am the reason Harry lost his parents, I am the reason every bad thing related to magic happened. That is what I was born to do. To create chaos. So you can understand if I didn't want you to think of me as some sort of monster. You were the first person I had met that I could begin anew with. The first person I could start off with a fresh slate. All the other members of your family knew about what I had done. It had been passed on from father to son. On my order. So that I can punish myself for what I did. So that I can be reminded of what I caused. But I eventually came to regret that decision. The death of your parents was on me, Tom. It is my fault. The magic they used. Stemmed from what I gave humanity. I could not bear the thought of you hating me as well. Seeing your past life memories, I couldn't let you bear and more hate than you already did that night. You were already at a tipping point he sat after 99, armor? I thought about his words for a long time. An entire day went by in utter silence until I finally digested everything both of them had said. I could understand it in a way. After all, Drac had suffered for more than I could ever imagine. The reason it took me a day was that I had to calm the anger I felt at being lied to. The only person I had to lean on after my parents' deaths lied to me. But in the end, I agreed to forgive him on the condition that he would be completely truthful from now on. But words were no longer enough, so we performed the unbreakable vow with Akeley as the middleman. There was nothing more to be done about it. Hating him wouldn't bring me closure. It wouldn't fix the past. So why bother dwelling on it? There was someone tangible to blame for my parents' death and that was whom I would be focusing on. The only good thing out of all this was that I now had answers to my questions. But new ones quickly took their place. So, the thing about how my family lived and married and their history and all that is still correct, right? The whole rating of houses and living in secrecy, I asked. I wanted to make sure. Correct. I only lied about my past. Your family and how they lived was all true. What about Liam's name? The Harbinger of Death? I asked. He was indeed called that. He had earned the name after all the killing he did in an attempt to protect his family. He once wanted to change the world, but that idea was short-lived. His need to protect his family took up all his time. And when we found him, well, he died that day. There was a moment of silence in the hall. It was all there. My family did indeed live in secrecy post Liam's death after Eklee manipulated the humans to go after my family. Why didn't you change the view on the Pendragons? Couldn't you have done something to stop them from chasing my family? I asked with confusion. I was a dragon of chaos. There was nothing positive about my powers. 
Plus, after being split, I had lost half of it. Furthermore, even if I could use the essence of light that my father had granted me, it wouldn't have been enough to stop so many people he said. I could only nod, but I turned to the sword anyway. So, according to what Akli is saying, you are actually almost indestructible unless attacked by one of your own species, right? I asked as I moved on to the next topic. Correct. Then why was my father so weak then? Sai I warned him about an impending crisis that would hit the family when I was first sealed inside of him, but I couldn't quite pinpoint when. Lance tried to take the next trial in order to increase his power, aka obtain the ability to turn into a dragon. But he failed. He was severely injured and couldn't use any of my abilities. When he saved you, he had already far exceeded his limit and used my strongest ability to transform himself into a dragon. He had long gone past the path of no return trying to buy enough time for your mother, brother, and yourself. He just couldn't do anything about the rest of them. The person that held him back was strong enough on his own he answered. I understood. That was why he teleported me away. So, what the sword, what Akli was saying is the true story. You two were once a single being that passed on magic to the human race. I asked. Correct. Then why do you make me go to a school? Can't you just teach me everything? I asked in confusion. Because I want you to live as much of a normal life as possible. Being with others your age will allow you to experience things you wouldn't be able to if you were secluded in a cave somewhere for years on end. As for why I don't give you all the spells and information you need and make you get it yourself. It is because I want you to accomplish it on your own. I will give you clues and tips, but the ultimate challenges lie with you. That is how a person grows. Naturally, some situations are exceptions he responded. I assume this must be Sapphire talking right? All that wisdom you have must come from her. I spoke. Correct, our sister was the wisest of us all he said with sadness. I turned to the sword with a hint of fury. And what happened to you? Seeing how cruel and emotionless you were back then, why are you being so nice now? Trying to trick me and make a comeback? I asked mockingly. Yes and no. I initially wanted to continue with my rampage but all those years of being sealed inside of a sword and experiencing the tragedies of humans has how do I put it softened me up. After all, with age comes wisdom. I also got Sapphire's wisdom don't forget, so let's just say I'm not as reckless as before. Plus, it wouldn't be any fun. There is no one to take me on if I decided to try again. Well, unless I go against you guys, but why do that when I can simply join you? All in all, I have turned a new leaf. Whether you can believe it or not that's how it is. Either way, as you are now, you wouldn't be able to handle the negative emotions that come with me he said simply. Before I could say anything, intense feelings of hate, anger, greed, and killing intent seeped out of me like a waterfall. I was beginning to lose consciousness. I could feel myself falling into a bottomless pit of despair. But a claw made of light burst through the darkness and grabbed onto me, dragging me up. When I came back to myself, I was covered in cold sweat, my hands were shaking intensely, and a devilish laugh could be heard echoing through the hall. Akli, do that again and I swear dash. Swear what? What are you going to do? We can't destroy each other. Well, that was what I thought until just now. Who would have thought you would actually accept dad's gift? You took the path of light, after all these years he said with surprise and disgust. I was surprised but then recalled the claw made of light that dragged me from certain death. Drac you, what made you decide to do it now? I asked. I have decided it was time for me to move on, the past wasn't going to change. It is what we do with that knowledge and how we proceed that defines us. I have a long way to go before I am versatile and proficient enough to reach my father's level. Now, weren't you here to take on the trial? As I see it, the boy doesn't even have the suit of armor yet he interrupted. Armor? I questioned. He doesn't even know that, said Akli with clearly fake surprise. He didn't have to know until now. I was going to explain it when he got it but since you're so impatient Akli I have no choice now, Drac said reproachfully. The armor is the second stage power. That was what I used to stop the truck from killing you a second time he said before being cut off. A second time, questioned Akli suspiciously. You will know when I'm sure I can trust you. I said truthfully. As I was saying before I was rudely interrupted. The second stage is pretty much my body compressed into a suit of armor. It has high defensive capabilities. Nigh unbreakable but it takes a lot of magic to use. And it is incredibly heavy. That was why the first stage was trained. You will need to activate the first stage and maintain it before superimposing it with the suit of armor. I'm estimating that when you first get it, you'll only last one minute before fainting due to fatigue. Training your body will need to be taken a step further in order to increase the duration. I was starting to worry. Would I look like a muscle head with all this training? An IT was all a lie? LMAO, that explains the shitty story Drac gave. I wanted to give Drac depth as a character. I mean, he pretty much acts like an assistant the entire time. There wasn't much character development for him. So, I thought this would be a good opportunity. This was intentionally done since the beginning, that's why there was a lot of plot holes in the story. Naturally, I could have simply redone the beginning by swapping it out with this one, but I thought this would be better for Drac. Tell me what you think chapter 100, trial begins. I shook away the useless thoughts and accepted the fact that I was destined to become a muscle head. Dad was just as big and strong even when he was injured so if I look like that it wouldn't be so bad. Okay, so how does this trial thing work? I asked. Simple, there is a magic circle in the middle of the hall. The heat from the surroundings will increase to scorching temperatures no living being can endure, which will temper your body. 
Aikli here will attack you with his dark powers in order to temper your mind. I will be on standby just in case. Usually, I would be the one attacking your mind but since all three of us have come to an agreement of sorts, I think Aikli deserves a chance to prove the honesty of his words. Plus, since I have gone down the path of light, most of my dark abilities have gone away he said. I was surprised and apparently so was Aikli. Wait wait wait, you're saying you're going to let me participate? He asked with astonishment. I have let go of the past Aikli. You are now your own person, I must treat you as such. What? You don't want to take up the task? Okay that dash. Wait, I never said no, did I? You detestable snake he said angrily. TCH? Who's the one stuck in a sword you piece of metal? Argued Drac. And who was the one who did that to me? Huh, yelled Aikli as the sword began to vibrate. Because you are an evil piece of shit, said Drac angrily. Enough both of you, I yelled. For God's sake stop it. Enough quarreling, it's already enough with just Drac and now there are two of you, I said while massaging my head. You're more like twin siblings rather than the same person, I said, but to my surprise there was silence. I guess. He's right, they finished each other's sentence. Whatever, hurry up and let's get started. The faster you get stronger the quicker I can be free of this god-awful cave said Aikli with resentment. Agreed. Tom head towards the magic circle that's right in front of the throne and sit down. We will take care of the rest. I nodded and raised my head towards the center of the room where a massive magical circle was engraved into the ground. Pillars were erected and different shaped dragons were on top of pedestals in between the gaps in the pillars that surrounded the magical circle in its entirety. There was only one entrance. The throne was on the other side of the encirclement, where the sword rested glowing with an ominous light. I ignored the sword and walked slowly into the middle as I observed the dragon statues. Drac, are these statues representative of something? I asked. There were only three kinds. Yes, they are. The lean and majestic one is the image of Sapphire. The dumb looking one is Hespot. And the rugged and arrogant looking one is Zephyr. They're our brothers and sister. Each representing a certain characteristic he said with emotion. I see. A sort of shrine for them. I guessed. Correct. I nodded and didn't say any more. I had arrived at the middle of the engravings where an empty circle was. I sat there and closed my eyes. The trial will be segmented into two parts that superimpose themselves. The body trial. It consists of exposing the body to extreme heat. The magical circle has three uses. One of them will increase the amount of pain you feel by several fold. When the pain caused exceeds your body's threshold, the second part of the magic circle will activate. It will deconstruct your body into atoms. Then the third part will reconstruct it again while making it stronger in the process. You will feel the pain of having your body torn to pieces before being put back together. Once put together again, the trial will resume, and the cycle will continue. This will last until the trial no longer has a significant effect on you he said calmly. But all I heard were the words of the devil. This was beyond anything I could have imagined. What was the difference between this and hell I wondered. You know, every time I have witnessed this trial, I always think to myself, did dad make a mistake? Did he seal the wrong half in this sword, he said. I could tell he was actually thinking about this seriously. Shut it, as I said before, painful but effective he said without a care. Next is the mind trial. Aikli will simply do to you what he did before but worse. He will show you your darkest moments and replay them in your head over and over. This will make sure you are able to handle the psychological pressure that comes with the armor. You must be able to endure the pressure it exerts on the body. The mind affects the body and the body affects the mind, if even one of them is not in balance with the other then you will collapse. I will only ever intervene when your mind and soul are about to break down he said seriously. The more he talked the more sweat began to soak my clothes. What kind of lunacy was this? So, my body would go through constant deconstruction and reconstruction in order to get stronger. And my mind would be raped to the point where I could end up brain dead. Not to mention this had to do with the soul? Drac, how can you make people go through with something like this? I asked. It is the fastest and more effective way. Unless you wish to spend decades doing it the slow way sitting on a mountain doing nothing, this is the only way he said dismissively. I sighed heavily. This was simply stupid, but it had to be done. In any case, who cared about the repercussions of failing, in the worst case scenario, I would die. And guess what, I've already done that. It's nothing scary so fuck it. I shrugged. Go ahead when you're ready, we're on a time crunch anyway, I said dismissively. I used eclumency to the highest degree in order to resist the evil energy from Aikli and to block out the pain I was going to have to endure for a week and a half. Huh? The kids got balls. Let's go Drac, I haven't been this excited in centuries. Stay close I might go overboard frequently he said with a mad laugh. My mouth twitched severely at his words. And here I thought he was actually the less sadistic of the two. If you know that then rein it in. Drac spat angrily. Nah, that's what you're here for, you nanny, he mocked. You dash. Gentlemen, please, let's start this already, I said. I was tired of their arguing. You heard the boy, hop to it Drac. Aikli continued to mock. 